Hey everybody, what's up? It's uh, Kurt the Arborist, Arborist Blueprint Podcast. Tonight we've got a super awesome episode uh, with Wyatt Spruck. You can find him at spruckster.tree on Instagram, or maybe you know him from You Got Sprucked on YouTube. He recently released a documentary film that he made by himself. I don't know how he did it. <laughs> it's called A Love Letter to a Boar Culture. So if you haven't seen it yet, definitely go check that out. We're going to be talking about that today, a bunch of uh, other things as well. I should just give you a quick disclaimer. This episode's probably not going to be good for children. We're going to be talking about uh, a variety of things. Some of those things might be some more serious mental health stuff, but mostly tree stuff. Why it's a cool guy. I found him uh, because of his Instagram. It said oh, he was a work positioning enthusiast. So I wanted to learn a bunch of stuff from him. Uh, we recently reconnected. After uh, he had some time off, I think, from the industry there. So we're going to get into that. But The Arborist Blueprint Podcast is proudly sponsored by Atmos Tree. Atmos Tree is a regenerative alliance founded by myself, Kurt the Arborist, that brings arborists together to plant more trees than we are removing. The 2 to 1 Tree Cycle Program is an off-site tree replacement initiative that is funded 100% by small recycling fees that we charge our clients when they require a tree removal. These funds cover all costs from seedlings all the way to monitoring. There is zero cost to arborists that join the Alliance. When you join the Alliance, there are also multiple benefits for your business to take advantage of. Atmos Tree is a green marketing tool that can help you win more quotes and attract new conscious clients. We provide you with pre-made line item titles and descriptions for your quotes and invoices that explain the recycling fee and direct them to Atmos Tree for more information. We provide PDF info cards and thank you cards you can optionally attach to your quotes and your invoices. We offer a free branding toolkit complete with professional logos, badges to advertise your affiliation on your website through email communications or other social media channels. We'll mail you decals to add to your equipment that display the two to one tree cycle badge. We add your logo to our website with other Alliance members, which backlinks to your website. We also share collaborative posts through social media to advertise your new affiliation through Atmos Tree and Kurt the Arborist Instagram pages to boost awareness. If you are interested in more information about Atmos Tree, please visit atmostree.org and fill out our contact form. You can also follow us on Instagram at atmostreeorg. So please join our growing alliance of arborists and contract climbers from around the world. Together, we can make an impact and be responsible for planting more trees than we remove. It's free and Atmos Tree takes care of everything. Thanks, guys. Now back to the podcast. Enjoy. Here he is. I'm going to let him in. Welcome, Ugh. Wyatt. There he is. Sorry, I was going to do creepy lighting like this, but now I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no worries, man. All right. How does my mic sound? Your mic, uh, it sounds not too bad. All right, because I gonna mess with the gain and all that stuff. Okay. Or how close I get to it. So just let me know because I'm still figuring this out. Yeah, no worries. I mean, the fact that you have a mic and headphones is a uh, is a good sign. But you're like a yeah, tech I dude. Yeah, try. I guess you have to be a tech dude if you're uh, if you're making documentary films. Yeah, it's actually sometimes <laughs> the hardest part because it does it gets in the way when you're like I have a cool idea and then you got to learn some. Oh gosh! To get it down, and even then, it's not even right. Yeah, we uh, recently tried to hire someone for Atmos Tree to do a bunch of CRM software behind the scenes, you know, like where people can sign up and all this kind of stuff. Like, because I'm like, I'm so busy, I'm not a tech guy. I just want to pay someone to do it, and of course, that falls through and it doesn't work out, and it's more headache than it needs to be and i don't know man i'm just realizing it's like if you want it done right you have to do it yourself sometimes pretty much <laughs> yep. so did you did you end up doing your own website and stuff like that because for the same reasons oh yeah yeah and i love social media and website and branding and all stuff like i'm sure you do too but it you know it does take a lot of time and it is nice to offload things i, I try to balance it with thinking like you know what part of me is trying to just do it myself because nobody else can do it right or is it the wrong attitude and should i just be kind of letting go you know like sure but i mean if they don't do it though they don't do their job like what do you do so yeah but thanks uh, for meeting me here tonight keep going you keep keep talking i have to put something <laughs> over that light or it's gonna blind me i'm no listening worries. no worries i had already uh <laughs> i already started everything up so not that i can't okay. edit it not that i can't edit things <laughs> out but uh it'll be funny 
It'll be funny. Look, there. I mean, there's not Wyatt. He's gone. He's fixing his light. Hey. I like your backrest. It's just a bunch of uh, chainsaw pants folded over a chair. Yep, that's how we do it. All right, I put something over the light to diffuse the light because that's what a professional would do. Mm. I wish I could now show you mine. It's like literally an Ikea lamp. And I took a bunch of parchment paper, which is basically like a wax paper, and just taped it to like some oh. cardboard. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh, you know, makeshift for now until I... That's perfect. This is a dirty t-shirt over a seasonal depression lamp. Okay, sweet. I got, look at, I got one of those too for like my, whoa, right there. That's a good one too. It's nice and flat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just, it's going off the wall. Oh, thank you. Just got a cupcake delivery. Cupcake delivery. Yes. My dog's in here now. Hamish, beat it. <laughs> <laughs> He's he's following the cupcakes, but uh, yeah. So I checked out your your film. Uh, yeah. Yesterday, I wanted to sit down like on my own in the evening and do it, but like time just didn't uh, make it work for me. So and I, I did oh, sort yeah. of do it half with my uh, wife and then half upstairs by myself. And but man, it was awesome. I really enjoyed it. So Thank kudos you. kudos to you. And all I could I couldn't help but thinking the whole time watching it is like how much work that must have been with all of those clips and editing and music, you know, like how long did it take you to edit that thing? So I think I sat down, it was six weeks ago. It was a five week process altogether from oh, beginning to end. That's and like it long. said in the thing, you know, five, well, five weeks, but it took me years to get all the footage for it. Mm -hmm. And I spent upwards of 12 hours a day sometimes even on work days doing that so i just come home and wouldn't even take a shower i just sit down in my dirty work clothes and start editing so Man. it was a long time like five be i guess it's not a long time but for someone doing everything themselves five weeks i thought was pretty that's pretty quick, awesome actually i think uh and that's what it takes man is the grind you know like you talked about it a little bit in your <laughs> and you kind of call it a documentary is that cool like i or, like that that's fun. okay um, it's called a love letter to a boar culture on YouTube. I'd already kind of did a little quick preview before we jumped on here, but, um, I think you mentioned in there, like, you know, you can have the dream and you can have the inspiration and these ideas and stuff, but it takes grinding to like get mm -hmm. stuff done and to do it and make these dreams come to fruition. <laughs> I was thinking about that as I was rushing home tonight, having a nightmare day yeah. doing some tree work and it's like. Okay, we're gonna go fire up a podcast for a couple hours. It's like I love it, of course, but it's like sometimes mm. you just gotta go, go, go. Yeah, making yourself do stuff when you don't want to. That's that's a I tricky know, one. It's part of responsibility. Yeah, yeah, that is a bit of a hard part. I think uh, getting over that that urge or that hump. It's like I, I know I don't feel good. You should probably take the dog for a walk and just kind of reset or go to the gym or something because you know you're gonna feel good, but you don't want to do it at the time. Yeah. But it's always yeah. easier in hindsight. I think we're evolving. Like as we go forward as a species, we're learning to hate discomfort more and more. And it's kind of like the great equalizer of all of our behaviors, I think, because that, that some of the spectrum spectrum of pain and pleasure, you know what I mean? You have yeah. to have a balance of each. It's a common theme and a lot of anything. Yin yeah. and yang and all that. Dude. <laughs> oh man. So crazy. I have a, I have a point written down here that I was going to ask you about uh, or talk, wanted to talk to you about was your cycles to failure and finding balance and like literally was picturing yin and yang and wrote like yin and yang down here. So I don't know, some sort of weird connection. Each time we chat, it's like we're totally on the same wavelength each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of similar similarities in uh, I think our personalities, which is cool. That's why I was really excited to connect with you. I originally found you through Instagram. This was like years ago. And mm -hmm. I even looked back, I forgot I even edited a few photos to do like a photo collab with you because you're a photographer as well, um, a sure. videographer. So I think I was attracted to your Instagram page and that you had some sweet photos, but I was totally learning at the time and you called yourself, uh, or you still do, a work positioning enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I was like, I think even when I joined at the time, I was like, what's work positioning? I'm like, this is not a good <laughs> sign. <laughs> I should probably follow this guy. Yeah, I know. I love it because... I think we are to a certain extent scientists, but yeah. really when I started the Instagram, I thought it was about, I just, I was fascinated by what this one person's climbing style and how they had made a popularity and like a little community on Instagram. And so I started doing it and 
Yeah, man. I am a work positioning enthusiast. And there's a story in that movie, too, about why. Uh, I, You know, Edward Gelman, the yeah. uh, University of... Uh, so I, he came and visited us, and I, I made a really big mistake, a stupid mistake, when I was climbing and subordinating a tree. And I'll leave it at that so I don't give it away. But yeah, that, that story, that trauma led me to wanting to like dial in and better understand and explain to myself what work positioning is and what the purpose of it is. Cause it's often, you know, it's the most obvious thing. It's like stand in a spot where you can make a cut safely. Well, there's so much more to it than what it looks like. <clears throat> yeah. I remember watching that part in the film there and I was like, Ooh, <laughs> Oh, that, dude. that would I suck. I, I, I could feel your pain. I yeah. even told my wife after I was like, Hey, that guy I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> I'm like, here's this book that I got. He went to this workshop with this guy that like wrote the book on pruning. And uh, yeah, yeah, this happened. I won't spoil it as well, but mm, I was God. like, yeah, yep. he likes to learn from mistakes like me. <laughs> I do. I get to do it a bunch of times sometimes. Relearn the same shit over and over. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's the important part. I mean, if we don't make mistakes, again, the yin and yang, it's like, if you don't have the bad, you can't have the good. And Unfortunately. Un unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know. I was also contemplating this yesterday, uh, you know, our different personalities. So we'll get into it maybe a little bit later. I don't know, but I'll talk a bit about the movie first. But basically, I see myself as like having these ups and downs too a lot. And it's like you can't have the goods and the ups without having those low days. And it's like I used to just always try and change them and make them better and make them all good. But you can't cycle good all the time like you have to have balance and if you push the good for too long it's like then you get this huge backlash of bad and so i'm just trying mm -hmm. to like live in the bad when it comes sometimes because sometimes it comes like without reason you know it's not like all these things happen to you or even if they did all these things did happen to you it's like you don't have to just dwell in it and go i don't know get really upset about it but you can you can still be in it but just more neutrally i guess i would say Sure. wait for it to kind of ride and pass on and then you know what you're going to come out of it but i don't know what do you think i, I know what you mean you're going to have your initial reaction or emotion to something whatever stressor or stimuli it might be i think the the marker of a person who's growing is everyone's going to have that initial thing like oh that pissed me off because you disrespected me or whatever instead of doing the original behavior the one where you get mad and just kind of react yeah, I would prefer to respond. So in that totally. same sense, like uh, you're giving yourself the option. You, if you have the the simple awareness to give yourself the option, it I think it just leads to a better, smoother social experience when you're a little less reactive and a little bit more responsive, I think is the way to put it. Yeah, 100 percent. That's uh, I just did like I'm in a men's group when I have time and we just did like a whole thing on reaction versus responsive. Went to TCIA, mm -hmm. Ontario. Um, there was a guy there, Tony or Anthony from Arboriculture Canada. We did a did a talk on stoicism with the rural culture, and his whole thing was about <laughs> responding versus react reaction, and it plays a lot of a part in tree work. I mean, people are stressed because things are, you know, the weather mm -hmm. could be crappy. You're hungry. You're tired, and I don't know. Things are dangerous usually, and. Uh, somebody messes up and you want someone to get a little quick done things done a little bit quicker and it's so easy just to react and try and let those emotions out in a way you're probably going to mm -hmm. regret later but i think to be a good leader you know you've probably developed those skills to respond versus react we all make mistakes though of course yeah that's yeah. that's a difficult thing on the job site like you could be really technically proficient and like a super good climber and rigging and all of it but at the end of the day, I, I think tree work is less tree work and more about working with people because, I mean, you could be an arborist by yourself, but the way yeah. we do it is it's a team process. And that's so to some people, that's unfortunate. And that was an unfortunate discovery for me because I thought it was like the climber just runs the show. You're the dude and then you don't have to rake and you get to be the person everyone thinks is cool. And I slowly started to realize, well, like, first of all, the people on your crew are the most important thing. And then how you talk to clients in the public are another thing. But yeah, if you can't talk to people, you're not doing tree work, unfortunately. It just, it's one of those things. There's some trees you can't do alone. And yeah. I'd prefer not to really do anything tree work related alone, honestly. I like 
coming to work and being on a team, having me, friends around. That's that's it. Me too, man. I did uh, a couple of years kind of by myself here in Cochrane. We have small trees. It's the foothills. They don't get huge. So I'm not an mm -hmm. awesome climber. I wouldn't say. I'd say it's one of my weaker spots. You know, compared to you, it's like one of your strengths. So, and I know you talked about this in the sh in the movie too. And it was like, what's an arborist to you? Like you versus me. Like we're both arborists. You're work positioning, tons of rope, tons of experience in that sense. Um, and on my end, it's like, that's something I'm always working on. I'm always thinking of, but I don't get the reps in there. And sometimes it bugs me. And I think, you know, like, oh, I'm just not a good arborist because I can't climb and stuff. And, or, you know, I can, but it's like so basic. And, but uh, I'm still an arborist. I love, I love tree health and soil health. And I, I've learned now, I guess, to uh, do things that I'm good at and really fuel those as well. Like connecting mm -hmm. with people, that's a huge thing. That's a big part of this podcast actually is that human interaction and how it relates to business and building your business and selling yourself and marketing. Like everything's just so connected in that sense. But anyways, getting back to that whole point is um, my wife was like, we, we need to help her. Like you're calling me too much, complaining. <laughs> you, you need someone <laughs> with you. So we got to help her. And man, that, that did change it. Like even today I had a bit of a rough day, but just having somebody there with you you know, mm -hmm. to kind of get you out of your funk and you're both sharing the experience together. It's, it goes a long way. And that's really, like you said, that's what it's all about. It's all about the people. Yeah. And the, the commissary and camaraderie of, <laughs> commissary. you know, yeah, exactly. You're just kind of, I wouldn't say wallowing, but you're sharing the same experience and kind of just swimming in the difficulty, mm -hmm. pain, discomfort, whatever it is, even if it's momentary, because I don't think I've ever had a day free of discomfort doing tree work. There's always some little thing, you know, like I some. close a truck gate or something on my finger, like kick a trailer hitch. There's always some stupid thing. Yeah. But it just comes with the territory and you got to learn to laugh about some things. <laughs> yeah. Do you find ever uh, like those things that happen, like smashing your knee into the trailer hitch? Or for me, it's getting whipped in the face with branches. Like, do you find that comes like <laughs> as soon as you're like in the bad mood and you're putting out those low vibes, it's like you just start getting more of it. And it's like, yeah, it attracts yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it attracts it. Exactly. And it's sometimes it's so ridiculously obvious, mm. like literally getting slapped in the face by the tree. And it's like, okay, well, let's take 10 deep breaths here. The way I think about it is like the trees telling you you're whipping around. That's why you're getting whipped in the face. And it's probably because you're angry and moving all frustrated. And that's when you get care tools stuck and you break them off on stuff or, you know, a loop of your lanyard gets stuck on your foot. And then you just like chase your own tail for a little bit trying to figure out what's wrong, fall over, slip, that type of stuff. If you're not taking your time in certain trees too, you can really take a long time or F yourself up, you know? Yeah. You're not thinking. Yeah. And taking your time because it is a, it's a thing that requires so much patience, especially when you're starting out. So it does, or like yeah. training people, like people that aren't as experienced, it's just so second nature to you. And then someone else just needs way more time to kind of figure it out and to try and have the patience to let them work through that and make those mistakes is, is challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Being a leader and having kind of graduated through the difficult steps and then watching and having to let someone else go through right in front of you, the same mistakes and stuff like that. You got to kind of let people that you're teaching make mistakes. If that makes sense, like not mistakes that'll get them hurt or trapped or, you know, in a situation that'd be super uncomfortable, yeah. but uh, stuff like I was, I was teaching someone to rig one time and he had this piece and he was like, yeah, I'm just going to swing it over here. But it was like a forked log. And I'm like, if you rig that, it's going to go uh, and then get stuck on this as it swings over. And I just didn't say anything because I knew he'd be out of the way. It wouldn't hurt him. And yeah. I just wanted to see his face when it got stuck. And I, I, I said before he got, <laughs> I'm like, you really want to do that? Is that the last thing? All right. And I just stepped back, sat there in the CMC in the lift and just watched. And then I watched him have to climb down there and like pull it out and cut a chunk off and push. It was the whole thing. So yeah. you need to have those experiences. And as a leader, you sometimes have to allow people to have those, but you got to have the discretion not to put someone in a situation that's going to get them hurt or cost the company too much money. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> we call them uh, teachable moments. And I find yeah. when I'm helping with teaching, I'm an assistant instructor with Arbiculture Canada. So I'm learning to, instruct there and learning how people learn and they think and that kind of stuff. I love that kind of thing, but, um, mm -hmm. it's 
when you make those mistakes, you know, because we try and as instructors almost inherently want to do everything perfect. It's like, hey, we're going to demo this. It's going to go perfect. Explain how it's supposed to be. But they often learn a lot better when it doesn't go to plan. And like the instructor, the instructor is even human and makes a mistake or it doesn't go exactly as planned to show how tree work can be unpredictable or, you know, something messes up completely from some from someone and then we all get to come over and review it and see why. And it seems to sink in and make a lot more sense for a lot of people, you know, as long as we're staying safe, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. No, I we, agree, man. I had one, one experience today, if you don't mind me sharing. Um, Go got a, a, a new guy. Well, he's my buddy, but he's going to help me out this year. So we had like a spar left over and pretty wide, like 45 degree drop zone and stuff. And, you know, teaching him the stick trick to measure it out. And we'd, we'd cut on some bolts, you know, just like small sections of wood yesterday to kind of practice some face notches and everything for felling. So I'm like, here, why don't you cut down this spar? And so he gets the face notch all done. And then we're like, okay, well, we muzzle, we'll practice the bore cut and everything. But, you know, it just doesn't have those reps to know at the saw's level and everything mm -hmm. and then comes in on the yeah. one side and it's you know swings it forward to set the hinge but then kind of gets way too close and then bores through on this upward angle that like blows over the front of the face notch so it's like a mismatch on the one side i see it and yeah. it's just like oh okay let's figure this out and so we had to like figure it out together and i th literally thought you know cutting a new or no we ended up back cutting it actually because it was so high we back cut to kind of reset the hinge but we only had hinge on one side and then a mismatch mm. clicked off on the other side. So then it pulled the tree to one side. Mm -hmm. But again, it was like we went and reviewed it and talked about it. And it's like, here, this is why the tree pulled off course. This is why it did this. And it was, I think he learned a lot more from that. And I knew he wasn't going to get hurt. So it worked out okay. And it wasn't a situation where something was uh, like, it was a pretty open drop zone for the most part. Like it would have, yeah. if it fell, fell the most extreme yeah. direction in the 45, it would have been fine. Yeah. And, and that's it was a like good discretion to have as a, as a leader. So you made a good decision, uh, given the context, cause you could put people like, yeah, go ahead and cut that 10,000 <laughs> pound crane pick. And I'm not going to tell you how to do the cut properly. If you've never done it, like so, some people just get saw stuck cause they never ask questions and you never say anything. So yeah, just kind of get, man, that's, that's definitely it. You get hesitant and, uh, yeah, I don't want people to get hesitant either. Yeah. It kind of sucks when mm -hmm. they get quiet and they don't want to, it's hard to, hard to encourage them, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. um, making this, just curious, like it took you five weeks to edit it. Like how much, you said the footage took a lot longer. Like how much mm -hmm. footage did you have? How much did you cut out? So like, here's like a, one hard drive. So two this hour and 20 terabyte minute. hard drive. This is everything from when I started. So 2012 to 2020. All right. Yeah. So that's four terabytes. 2012 and I have two to more 2020. Of those. Oh, you went that I long? Yeah, 2012 to 2020. And I had like little GoPro footage. You know, this is another one here. I have three more. I just bought another one. Like I have all this footage backed up, terabytes and terabytes of it. And, wow. So uh, you must yeah. have cut out a ton, like a ton of stuff that you wanted to put in. Yeah. And most of it's the newer stuff from when I got a nice camera and I started filming more seriously and knew more about how to make things look better and all of that. So the yeah a majority of my footage was recent like yeah. the last five years and i got a camera that could shoot crazy footage so it was like big 4k files and stuff what kind of camera but the point is i've been it's a fuji fuji something i had to sell it though <laughs> you got it. you're gonna sell it i had to because uh, oh. when i was i was unemployed for a year i lived in florida and tried to switch careers and stuff so but i ended up coming home and then you know, I had to sell some stuff so I could feed myself. <laughs> yeah, that sucks. Well, that's life, dude. I went through a little rough patch, and that's what goes. How it goes. Yeah, it's hard sometimes to let go of those things that you love too. Um, mm -hmm. But it is doable. I mean, on a positive note, they say the things that we own can own us. So if you can live a little more minimally, you're a little more free. Yeah. I'm not living that way. Yeah. I got too much crap everywhere. I'd love mm -hmm. to clean it out. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I came out of the fire department, um, I went through some PTSD and stuff like that and had to find a new career. Didn't know what the heck I was going to do. And I ended up selling like all my photography stuff too, like all the studio stuff and lighting and mm -hmm. like down to the bare bones and people, you know, were so excited and came over right away and picked it up and 
which made it worse, you know? Oh, <laughs> so yeah, of course, you're all excited. I can't wait to create with your stuff. Yeah, and, and you're like, did I even sell it for enough? Because they're there so quick. And I'm like, shit. But I needed it, and I had to pay. I yeah. used that money to pay for arboriculture courses, mm. you know, which was great in the end. But, but yeah, it does kind of suck getting rid of that stuff, especially <laughs> when it can make you money. Like, did you have you ever done photography for people for money at all? Or just uh, like the kind of stuff you like doing yourself? I did real estate photography briefly. And not only is it not lucrative, but it is boring. Yeah. And I don't like Florida. And I don't ever want to go there unless it's for vacation to visit my mom or something again. Yeah. Uh, so I, I have made money making stuff before, but not for arbor culture and nothing that I've wanted to do. Yeah. Have you thought of any ways to to monetize uh, this this film? Well, yes. I've tried to figure this out. There's... The GoFundMe thing. Mm -hmm. I just said, hey, I've tried to buy a camera. I made this movie. If you feel like it, donate. It not really didn't really work. And I kind of don't blame people. I think the way to do it is to get monetization through YouTube and just make videos, which will take some time. I don't think the film's going to be monetizable because there's copyrighted content in it too, like the music that I am yeah. unwavering on and will not change because it I'm not going to get into that. I, I'm not going to change it. People can't watch it in certain regions too because it's blocked for copyright. And oh. so YouTube, whatever money it does make, it's going to make whoever. I don't know. I Oops. am. Uh, I, I don't, don't like it either, man. I don't know. I was touching my chin and it gave you a thumbs down. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't oh, even. Can it do that? Is it like a thing? Oh, but I was thumbs up. Okay. <laughs> it's weird. It. it just takes every thumb and makes it a thumbs down apparently that's awesome what the f you go like this <laughs> i know i'm really distracted i don't even yeah. know what we're talking about uh we were talking about making money on youtube that's right and then the blocking yeah. you mentioned that in the show you're like you're like i don't care i'm just doing it and that which is great like mm -hmm. i believe it's a it was a creative outlet for you and there's something to be said about doing something the way you want to and not the way some other people want you to do it. I totally get that. And that's great. And I think that was probably, it's probably like therapeutic to a degree, right? Doing it obviously. Right. And, mm -hmm. uh, it for sure was, I mean, I was worried though when you said, uh, it's, there's some copyright there because I've had some like stupid little videos and they've been shut down so quick on YouTube. And I was like, great. Like, how long is it going to be up for before people can't watch it? So if anyone's listening to this, go watch it now. I is mean, any... it's wait. Uh, so hold on. It's blocked regionally in some places, like just can't open it in a few places in like maybe Australia is one of them. And then like if you're in the, U in the U.S., you're fine. I just can't make money off the video anymore, but it doesn't block people unless they're in a blocked territory. Either way, no money for me for this. If people want to see it, down, so. if people listen to this, for example, and they want to see it or they hear it from somebody else, can they get it from you somehow on the side to watch it? Mm -hmm. okay. okay. So what I've been offering is a Google Drive, like an MP4, and it's a 21 gig file. I just send a link and you download the file. I don't know how long 21 gigs takes for most folks. I don't know what internet systems computer hardware all that kind of stuff it depends but i just say go to work set it to download go to work and come back that cool. might be a, the move but yeah if you need that i can send a link it's a google drive link okay sweet yeah and then i mentioned uh right before we started but you're on uh, instagram at spruckster mm -hmm. and on youtube you got sprucked yeah uh i mean they'll probably see some trailers and things like that on there too so because mm -hmm. you have so many versions and i'm sure you can break that show up or into a whole bunch of small clips and, and put them on, right? Yeah, I have more clips I can make for sure. But what I'm going to do is all... It says that there's... Uh, actually, I'm not going to give that away. There's an Easter egg with the chapter numbers. But I'm going to put all what? 16, 16 chapters on each separately and then make a playlist, you know? So that way, like, just the parts that are blocked, everyone else can watch the rest of the movie everywhere else. They might just have to skip, like, chapter 6. Or uh, a seven tangles. I use this song by Travis Scott yep. called "Sicko Mode." The beat's really cool. Yeah, and they got blocked. I love the music in it. 
it's freaking the music in that movie, dude. I, it's all stuff I listened to from the the period of time I was kind of describing too. So yeah. that pandemic till till about now was all trap and hip hop. So it just kind of defined the area. Like I said, it's a time capsule. I want to go back and go. It's like looking at a yearbook, kind of, but just a better yearbook. Yeah. So when you first started this thing, you must have had a bit of an idea or outline, or maybe you could tell me like, where did the idea come from? Was it like a long time build up thing or was it like, boom, hit you one night, I'm doing this. And then, you know, then it, it was over a period of a number of years. Mm. It must have changed as you went along. You know, you got the new camera and ideas change and newer content. Mm -hmm. But how did that all evolve and come, come about? Yeah. So I made this little music video with a friend called Love Letter to Arbor Culture. And then it was just music to climbing footage. Some of the nicer stuff I've shot, actually. And then I wanted to make take the whole year of 2020, uh, 2020 and 2021 and just make... Because I'd written this thing called A Love Letter to Arbor Culture. It was actually a letter I was trying to write. And I wanted to use all the footage that I had stockpiled for years and years. And I just hadn't been... So earlier this year, I met a girl who basically kind of goaded me to start making stuff again. She, she said I wouldn't make a video, and I was like, I'll make this video. It was a commentary on a stupid movie, but it took me two hours, and I'm like, wow, I made this. Why don't I just start making that interview I wanted to make with Brian? And when I went to North Americans, I filmed an interview with Brian Brock, and that's what I really wanted to make. That's what Love Letter was going to start with. And so I made the interview. It took me about a week. And then I was like, well, there's more I want to add. And there's more I want to add. And then five weeks later, I have this two and a half hour long project sitting, looking me back in the face. And it just kind of got out of hand, but in the most beautiful way. Hmm. Because uh, the, the longer I looked into this nail footage and every time I go and get another hard drive and look through footage, I'm like, I have all of this stuff. Am I just going to let time go by and go by and go by? and lose interest and possibly put these in storage and forget about them. Um, I got to like reconcile with myself over how the last few years have been too. And as much as I didn't want to do it, I was like, I'm going to at least start by going through the footage. And so I watched the video of me proposing to my wife and now I'm divorced. You know what I mean? So that's painful shit to look at. Mm -hmm. I've, I've got footage of me in not so desirable, unwell, health doing not very well intoxicated stuff like that and yeah just hours and hours of me ranting drunkenly and manically and no sleep it was just a really bad time and so i needed to go through the process of looking at that i think because i've been hiding from it for so long and uh it's time to move on kind of thing and so i thought let's start creating again let's get a new job that's cool and exciting let's start talking to people again and not hide in the house and so I said, let's make this interview. And now this is what it's turned into. And uh, it, I don't think it would have been possible without the community. The, it's the only reason it exists is because of the community. Like so the people I'm you had in proud your, of it. The people you had in your film, you mean, that were part Those of it? Those folks. Or? But just like the people that have taught me stuff and who have been supportive and inspirational and things like that. It's, it's like Along I said, it's like a family. Yeah. Or like a family. Oh, that's awesome, man. Um, it must have been hard, I mean, physically, just to go through all that footage and put it all together. And you said mentally going through some of that stuff, um, like therapeutically or acknowledging or, you know, maybe you had changed and you'd gone back and or things had changed, circumstances have changed, and you're going back and reliving that. You said uh -huh. you were kind of avoiding it. Like, were you avoiding it because you didn't want to acknowledge that's who you were at that time or like were you ashamed of that were you just brings up old feelings and you didn't want to get like triggered by it or something like that it just it sucks to see yourself as like a worse version of you especially now that i'm better it's mm -hmm. like why look in the past however i could be doing so much better if i was just not holding on to so much of this baggage and like i'll carry baggage for years for the mistakes and you know people i've hurt and things like that uh, but I think without just staring it in the face and I have all this footage of it, like I have the best resource for fully understanding what it is other people see when I act that way. Yeah. And so I thought it was a disservice to the people in my life and my own 
self-healing and development if I just threw this footage away and did nothing with it. And I had an idea at the time. I was like, what do other people see? And so every time I would get home and start drinking and doing whatever project and talking about stuff, I just set the camera up and I thought maybe one day this will be valuable or something, or maybe there'll be something I can learn from this hmm. in my little drunken haze. I still had some semblance of a creative right. buzz happening. So right. yeah, it's, it's hard. It was a hard thing to do, but I'm glad I did it. That's good, man. Yeah. I'm proud of you for doing that. That's, that's a lot to do. A lot of people don't tackle that journey to acknowledge those things. Do you feel like you had a version of you, like the Wyatt that like a lot of your peers knew people like at your work day to day, uh, other friends? I mean, I'm sure some of your family or like your wife, you know, knew a lot of different levels of who you were, like the good and the bad kind of thing quote good or bad but were you like hiding that side of yourself like so you felt like you wanted to bring that to light to kind of show like here's who i am here's the full the full gamut be authentic you know set you sure. free in that sense was that kind of sure. i think as human beings we all strive to be understood by the people around us mm -hmm. i say that's one of the, the ultimate goals of, of just having that internal peace and homeostasis is knowing that people around me not only acknowledge me and value me but they they see me for who i am faults and all and yeah. they still want to you know be involved and around me and love me and support me and things like that yeah that's that's tricky and i think at least for me i i relate just in a, a ptsd type mm. you know background which is tricky too because it's it's a label right but it's yeah it's a label as a result of um behaviors and not learning to express emotion from from a child and then that just makes you sensitive and susceptible to get ptsd and then you know you can overcome it and whatever um and i've learned so much from it but you know ultimately when you peel back all these layers of like why did i act like that because of this and why did i react like that and like you, you go far enough back and it's like we all just want to be like accepted and and like loved unconditionally from our, our family mm -hmm. at minimum you know or in, and our friends to an idea or or to an extent like of course not everyone's like that you have to wear different hats like you know you got to work and you know for the city or whatever you're doing and it's like you got to be you're expected to be a certain type of person and represent them so you're you're a bit of a you know i hate to say like a number but like you're a you're a piece of that whole greater puzzle and sometimes you don't want to mm -hmm have personal flavors, I guess, influence that job, which is, you know, fine. Sure. But of course we have ups and downs, but ultimately the people that are close to us, I think our friends and our family, we want to be able to express ourselves in those safe places who, mm -hmm. for who we are and be loved and accepted on those bad days because you can't be good and you can't be on all the time. Yeah. Agreed. That's exactly my point. And a lot of that is like, I just come to work every day, holding on to this horrible thing in me and these thoughts that I had processed and constantly isolating myself and stuff. That's kind yeah. of part of substance abuse too, is like, I, I couldn't drink the way I like to drink just like at the bar after work with people. Yeah. So I found myself spending a lot of time alone so I could do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah. You're talking about like being a different version of yourself. That's exactly what it feels like looking at that old footage and then looking at myself now it's it's a, it's a weird thing i said something like i was a familiar stranger or looking at the stuff in the movies like looking at a familiar stranger the best mm. way i can put it is it looks like me kind of but i just i can't imagine myself being that like way that? now wow so people need to know about you if you're going to do this safety sensitive job i think it's unbecoming for people to not consider the humanity, that component of it, meaning it's not yeah. all just we're breaking our backs and working and trying to make money and get to the next job. It's there's a more holistic approach to how you can spend your time trying to support yourself. Yeah. Earning income. And it doesn't have to be this hustle, hustle, hustle all the time because there's not a lot of longevity or sustainability in that plan because as young men, I think we can, we can wear ourselves out in 10 years if we work like that you know yeah. what i mean people people do that to themselves and it's it's culture based yeah we make the culture 
So we have to decide whether or not this is the kind of place we want to work where we talk about, hey, I'm going through a divorce right now, so I might be a little distracted. Yeah. Judge me if I need to be paying attention and I'm yeah. not. Or, or have a bit of patience. Whatever. Like I might not be on my, my A game today. Exactly. Like, I can't be on my exactly. A game every day. Yeah, and if guys yep. get to know you and you know each other, like uh, mm -hmm. I know th through the fire department from my own experience, like there, and my wife, she's a nurse, um, we have something called like trauma bonding, right? So like this camaraderie in the fire department and different things, it's just insane. Like uh, I've had people where I, I, I wouldn't get along with them at all. We just butt heads like in the fire department. They were just dicks, you know, I didn't like them at all. But then you'd go through some insane experience where you have to pull it together and go through it. And it's just, it's, it's nuts what's happening. And it's so brutal that you have to go through it. And then you come out on the other side, like with this connection with that person that I don't know, it, it couldn't have happened in any other way. And you yeah. always have that link to that person on such a personal level that can never be taken away from you. And mm -hmm. it, it does add that human flair so there is that a little bit of understanding and that bit of a look you can give each other you know in the future because you've been through it right mm -hmm. yeah i think it goes a long yeah. way and you mentioned you know some of those things like working with the crew and i think a lot of that comes from leadership too you know when you're out there hammering like some days you got a hammer and every but i mean people can get in the groove too and that get on that vibe everyone's mm -hmm. loving it you know maybe you got some music going whatever but everyone's working hard together on the same level. And those are great days too. But sometimes one or two people are not going to be in it. And I think from a, a leadership perspective, if the leader can set that tone, as far as getting to know his crew, getting his crew to bond together, you know, there's a reason why these corporate places do these team building events and all this, whatever. It's mm -hmm. just, it seems kind of stupid and ridiculous, but when you have some sort of experience together, it, it bonds you. And then everyone works more cohesively and understands each other on a personal level. And then all of a sudden yeah. productivity goes way up and, and then naturally you're, you're more productive, you know, but I think that mindset of grinding and pushing everyone to the limits to try and make money is like, it's unfortunate because it starts with that poor mindset in the first place. Like why, why are you running a business and just trying to crush and make money and destroy people that work for you. Like at the end of the day, like, like what do you need that money for? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, we need money to survive. Of course, this is the currency we all agree upon to, to make it through life here. But I always think about everyone that's out there working hard, doing overtime and they take their money. And then I'm like, well, what are you gonna do with that money? Oh, I'm going to take two weeks off in the summer. We're going to go on vacation. Okay. So you're gonna spend all this money to go somewhere else. Uh, just to be with your family and friends. It's like, well, what was the best part of your vacation? Oh, it was these memories I had hanging out with my mm -hmm. family, doing this, going on that walk, doing this little thing. Memories that could exist at home for one, although it is awesome going mm -hmm. on vacation. I agree. There's, you know, you have a different mindset when you're in a new place. And so it kind of I think it creates mm -hmm. more memories, but why not just, you know, work less hard or for less time, especially if you don't enjoy it fully, but so you have that balance and spend more time with your family and friends, <laughs> you know, and just like, cause that's the end result, you know, like they make the money to go do this and, and work and why not just do that right away? It's, it sounds easier than it probably yeah. is, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we need me, we need other people more than we'll admit. I think a lot of people consider themselves, myself included on occasion, like a lone wolf. Like I don't need people. I'm just the mm -hmm. lone wolf. And that's, that's such BS dude. Like it's just, it's built into us. We need to be around other people. And so yeah. you have to take the, the difficult you know, friction relationships, the ones that are a lot of tension and, you know, uh, confrontation and somehow learn to m mitigate them. And like you're saying, if you go through certain things, go through certain jobs with people, you can't help but have a mutual respect for one another for having gotten through whatever crazy thing you had just gotten through. So it makes me understand or helps me to understand at least a little bit what the military might be like when it's, you know, two people three or whatever a whole group of people all getting shot at together and they have to like they're fending for their lives yeah we're we're just earning a living and you know we're working their power lines and at height and it's dangerous but it's not the same as someone shooting bullets at you i don't think i don't know so how... either way yeah difficult situations bring people together and we need people more than we think or realize i think because you know i i don't know about you but when i'm by, by myself too long i get a little weird 
you know, I get to feeling weird and thinking differently and I don't like it. But when I'm on all around other people, like I want to work every day, I'm like balanced and mm -hmm. I feel uh, enthusiastic about things. And I, I think clearer, you know, because I'm around other people and they balance you, you know, you need them. That's cool. I think the fact that you recognize that and, and what you need is is really important. I didn't recognize that for myself in the be in back of the days. I was a class clown and like always, yeah. you know, hilarious all the time and the center of attention and everyone loved it because it was charismatic. But I realized as I got and I went through this like healing journey and stuff that it was like it was all a facade. <laughs> I was just I got way more serious and less funny as uh as I healed up because I didn't need to like cope and create this like mm -hmm. this like persona of like getting that attention and whatever I was chasing after um, because I could just kind of be more real and more chill and authentic, I guess you'd say. And I learned, you know, later in life here, this last couple of years that, you know, as much as I thought I was like an extrovert to everybody, I'm actually quite a bit of an introvert and I do need that balance. And so, and I don't even feel like I'm non apologetic sometimes too. Now when we have people over and the house is busy and it's like, you know, sometimes I just got that feeling and it's like, oh, I need to go like just chill for a bit. Like I just need to go half an hour and go for a walk on my own and just reset mm -hmm. a little bit and just, no, it's no offense to anybody else, but sometimes I need that. But I do always come back to the people though. And, you know, I think we're tribal people. So it's, it's in us to be, you can't be on your mm -hmm. own for a long time. No, I think the worst thing you can do a person is, uh, it's not lock yeah. them in a box, put them in prison. It's to, to separate it from other people, you know, keep yeah, them alone. That's, That's like torture, isn't it? It's so horrible. It's torture, dude. It's torture. Dang. And people do it to themselves, unfortunately. And it's not for a fault yeah. of their own necessarily. Like if you're depressed, people they just naturally gravitate towards not wanting to be around other people. And it sucks. Yeah, it really does suck. You know, I don't know if I should. Well, we could talk about this, but you mentioned, are you okay with me talking about anything as far as mental health and stuff? You mentioned a little bit. In do your, it. In your, yeah. uh, in your show, but like. It's real. Like people get to the point, well, people do commit suicide, but people get to the point mm -hmm. of getting close and coming out of it. And it's this weird progression, you know, it's, it's a slippery slope. You know, once you've done it a few times, like getting close and then you look back in hindsight when you're healthier, you're like, whoa, I did not mm -hmm. realize those, uh, those warning signals. And it, and it starts out like with like that isolation and you're spending time by yourself and then addictions get more intense and you know you start having ideology which if people don't know mm. it's just like you just start it just crosses your mind you think man maybe i should just kill myself or yeah maybe it'd be better if i'm not here and then i find the next phase at least for me when it was bad is like because i'm like well how do people actually go from ideology to like actually doing it but then when it got mm. so bad it was like you all of a sudden hit this switch where you feel like you're a burden on other people like your spouse or your family. And then it's like, okay, I can't get myself together. And now they're trying, they're trying to support me. They're always there. They're always there. They're not leaving me. But then now I'm like, I'm ruining their lives. I'm making it worse for them. And then you feel like you shouldn't be there. And that that's flirting pretty close to, to the end, you know? So you backtrack, you know, you have a little bit of ideology. I don't think it's really healthy to be having any kind of ideology you should be if you're balanced you know not really having any in my opinion at least for me so now i look back now when i see those signs creeping up it's like hey i know i'm i know i'm way off balance i gotta do something here to try mm -hmm. and reverse it what do you have any comments on that or experience that you could share yeah i or if you want to, you don't been, have to, but yeah, having been diagnosed. Oh, so you're talking about diagnosis earlier. Yeah. I'm glad I caught this. Interesting thing I heard about a diagnosis is a diagnosis is just instructions on how to better take care of yourself. Mm. And I really like that because it comes with a so, guidebook kind of thing. A bit of a certainly. roadmap. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so when people hear bipolar, like I have bipolar too, and people will say stuff like, oh, the weather is so bipolar and stuff today. And I don't get mad about that kind of shit. It's it's because they don't know any better. But mm -hmm. there's a misunderstanding about what it means. And it's because there's a connotation, you know, kind of attached to the the word itself. And it's not a very understood 
disease. I guess my point is like, don't focus so much on the title itself and just know that it represents a cluster of symptoms of things that you need to take care of. And I think that made me feel better about having a title like that. And yeah, it's, there's so much crossover with other diagnoses too, that I have my qualms with the, with the DSM and like how psychiatry and doctors decide to you know, for prescribed medication and diagnose, but I'm not a doctor and I won't necessarily go there. But for right now, the information we have is the things that I I behave in brain chemistry, whatever it is that I have bipolar disorder. Some people have panic disorders. Some people are, uh, you know, they have personality disorders, which are a little different, but yeah, uh, yeah. Depression, anxiety, all of it. They're horrible. Yeah. Okay. There's a lot to unpack there, but yeah, I also <laughs> contemplate the same thing. I think everything is not is a spectrum. It's not black and white, you know, generally, because you could be labeled with say bipolar and mm-hmm. there could be a spectrum of bipolar, but it's not like a I have a little bit or I have full on bipolar. Maybe, maybe not, but there's like it's like this three dimensional web of how that could overlap with other things. Or bipolar could exacerbate mm-hmm. other personality attributes or something else could could um, influence the fact that you have bipolar. And then I also mm-hmm. contemplate stuff like, well, like PTSD that came from as a result of this and this and this. And even though that's a diagnosis, it's like, well, that was sort of developed, but then there's other stuff like say like bipolar or schizophrenia where it's like, is, is that organic? Like, are you, are people born with these things? And it's like, mm-hmm. like literally a deficiency, like I know a lot of people that have bipolar take like lithium. Like there's an actual measurable uh, like thing in your brain that needs to be replaced and it seems to work. So it's like, okay, that makes sense. And that would be really good to have a label for because then you have those parameters and that roadmap, like you said, where you can go and get a a medication and it can really help you out. I don't know. I've never had it myself. I'm just assuming that's how it works. Yep. Um, Yeah. Do you think about those? Like you just kind of alluded to that, but like, is there other things related to bipolar? Do you think people that have bipolar that don't need medication? They don't even know they have bipolar? Uh, well, or is okay. it pretty cut and dry with bipolar? It's not. And that's a really good question. So like when I was 15, I thought I was depressed and I, I was, but I went to the doctor, just a general practitioner at a clinic and told her my symptoms and told her that other people on my family were on antidepressants and it was five minutes and she wasn't even looking at me. She just wrote the script and kicked me out. Well, if you're not screened for bipolar symptoms and you go on an antidepressant, but specifically ones like Zoloft mm-hmm. or Prozac, they're uh, SSS, SSRIs. Yeah. They're a specific type of antidepressant. Anyway, they, they can make people with undiagnosed bipolar disorder uh, have a really horrible manic spike. And it's often the episode like the first precipitating episode that lands people in the hospital or the, their first arrest or suicide attempt and so yeah those the medications can be dangerous and that's the thing is like a lot of people think they have depression but they they fail to recognize that on the other side of the spectrum the times when they're feeling really really good yeah it's also kind of out of whack you know we're at the whole behavioral spectrum like human beings are this is where bipolar lives. It's the extreme of mania where you're super grandiose and super creative. You don't sleep, you don't eat and depression where it's total isolation, probably the same thing. You don't care for yourself, uh, hopeless kind of empty feeling. Yeah. And so I guess the goal is to try to get those moods to kind of be within the little, a little tighter spectrum. So you're not so high and low. And that's the issue is trying to find a balance, of not only lifestyle changes, dietary stuff, medications, right. but, um, a functional then there's like balance, the spiritual, a functional balance. Yes. And then that has you to have fit to come within to the terms. box of, of like how yeah. people live in general, which is also they, kind of yes. bullshit. Mm-hmm. Right. Because yeah, we don't have to. Yes. Yeah. So that's a tricky one. There was like, I can relate to some of the, some of the symptoms and I don't think anywhere to the extreme of bipolar, but they were considering sending me to a psychiatrist at one point mm. to see if maybe there was something there. Cause you know, they didn't know how to help me when I was at my worst, for example, you know, mm. and I went to the doctor too, with one of those similar experiences where it was like, I'm like, I'm having trouble concentrating and memory and, and whatever, and this and that. So she's like, Oh, here's this questionnaire. And it's like, fill out 
six things like, oh, do you ever walk into a room and forget what you were there for? I'm like, yeah, doesn't everyone? And it's like, do you ever forget your keys somewhere? And it's like, yeah. And it was like, if you got, you know, more than half of them, yes. And on like a six question questionnaire, I was like, okay, you're uh, approved for taking ADHD medication. So you might have ADHD. And it's like, really? Like this is, this is how it works. Dude. And uh, like, I don't know. I totally don't agree with how that kind of stuff goes down. I honestly don't even personally agree with psychiatry to uh to its fullest as as far as like now there's a lot of benefits but i don't think we should put all of our eggs in one western science basket just because somebody <laughs> no passed past school you know like you yeah. look at any classroom with all these people that pass their get their doctor there's like there's smart doctors and there's shit doctors i've seen some yep. really shitty ones that have no common sense and they don't get it and i don't even know how they passed and and like really but we put we put all of our trust in in that but we can't mm -hmm. trust this person over here who has some insight as to why you're feeling that way because they've had their own personal experiences and they're and they're very spiritual and whatever and it's like but that's not science so it doesn't count yeah i was like what brian was talking about in his interview with the climbers and tree people want shortcuts especially when you're new you're drawn to shiny things to try to want to solve problems or improve your skills and really that's not the way to do it um yeah, and psychiatry, man, it's it's in its infancy as an industry. So it doesn't like we're talking about the chemical imbalance theory. Like, oh, the reason people are depressed is because they don't have enough. There's an imbalance of dopamine or serotonin, and there's a right. It makes sense why that would that makes sense and why that's the narrative, and that's in every antidepressant, pharmaceutical commercial, and everything. But we don't have the technology, nor do we have any scientific data to support that as a theory. Mm -hmm. It's more of an idea. It's a chemical imbalance idea. Yeah. And it's beautiful in the sense that it makes so much sense because we know that we're, we have electrical signals and there's certain uh, chemical systems that are affected. You could scan the brain and kind of get an idea of uh, things are different, blood flow and stuff like that with a, a depressed brain versus a, a normal brain, stuff like that. But it's, it's an industry that is really flying by the seat of its pants to a certain extent. And I think yeah. as an institution, it's just like the legal uh, system. It's not designed to help people exonerate people or get justice. It's more about how can we make lawyers more money? And that's what yeah. the healthcare industry is now. It's just, it's the same oh, thing that business, lawyers have yeah. done. Yeah. It's a business. So, so there's a lot and of that's unfortunate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I mean, it's like it everything and nobody should be surprised government all these different things it's just like it's not there for the people to make people better and healthier and whatever it's it's there's so much just liability and red tape everywhere and about all the people mm -hmm. that are lobbying them and uh, that huge profit and like like yeah like you go to your family physician and they're like talking to pharmaceutical reps all the time pushing on them sell this like the, the fact that there's farm pharmaceutical commercials on tv is ridiculous like blows my yep. <laughs> blows my mind. Like you're trying to sell a medication to someone who's like you're not even being diagnosed to use that, mm -hmm. and you see somebody for like 15 minutes to get some of this stuff. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. And I think it's only one, it's only one lens and one perspective to to look at people and how they behave and and to help them with their problems. And like you said, it's like we can measure some of these things. We can measure that oh, this person's low on lithium in their brain. So the result is we'll give them lithium and look, look, that raises the lithium in their brain and their behavior seems mm. a bit better. So that's the solution. Although there could be side effects, although we don't know maybe yeah. why, why is the lithium low in the first place? Like what's the root problem of all of this? Is there other ways to make them feel better or to cope without having to take the medication? I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, I don't know much about bipolar in that sense, but do you get, do you get that uh, vibe as well? <laughs> So there is a misunderstanding a little bit. The So the, the reason why the chemical imbalance theory, I don't think is really a theory is well, yeah, it's not supported well with, with like a litany of evidence that's long lasting and repeatable. You mean like chemical balance, like of, with like depression yeah. and things like that. So to say that, okay, the reason, the reason, oh, okay. So to say that the chemical imbalance theory, there's not enough serotonin that's why someone is depressed and then to give them an antidepressant and then see that they're less depressed and say oh the reason that they're not they're depressed is because of the lack of zoloft in their their chemical system their bloodstream whatever it's it's a uh, paramount to saying something like 
oh, the reason that your headache doesn't exist anymore is, be, or the reason you had a headache is because of a lack of aspirin. It's the same logic, mm -hmm. and it doesn't make sense. I know that was kind of a long, shitty, drawn out version of that, but it's no, I, it's that makes sense. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. It's like, well, maybe you, you have can't... a headache because you haven't drank any water all day and you've been doing tree work in the sun, and you there need you a few go. electrolytes. You right into it. You got it. You got it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. Yep, that's exactly what I was getting Just at. because aspirin will solve it, but doesn't mean you should yeah. all of a sudden be on aspirin every day while you're doing tree work. At the end of yeah. this, man, we're just we're difficult to understand, complicated creatures. Although we can be boiled down to some pretty simple needs and necessities. Uh, when it comes to stuff like that, you know, just like how you're generally feeling day to day and having to support yourself and deal with that all day long if you're just constantly in pain it's it's just no way to live so no one wants to talk about it especially in an industry like ours where you're supposed to be tough and resilient and productive and efficient and all of that mm -hmm. and especially if you're trying to climb a ladder of you know seniority and you're trying to prove that you're technically proficient enough to move up in responsibility like i wanted to be the man now and like doing all the crane jobs and all the big crazy jobs and all of that and i got to it quickly and i was having a good time but it wears on you quickly having to be the man all the time and so especially if you're unwell and you're trying to come to work to be that personality it's just it's not sustainable it wasn't going to work for me so i'm sure if i was healthy i could have continued to have a really good run there at the place i was at so yeah you're old sustainable for me your old tree company yeah, I worked at this place in South Minneapolis. Shout out to Vineland Tree Care. They're the freaking best, dude. What are they called? They're a really good place. That Vineland Tree Care. Oh, Vineland. The Seward, okay. Seward neighborhood in Minneapolis. It's a really great place to uh, work. I learned a lot there, too, and got a lot of great opportunities. It's uh, it's a solid place to work if you're in the Twin Cities. Sweet. Just saying. Now, and now you're doing uh, municipal stuff. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah, pretty Yeah, I fresh? work at the park board. I like it. It is a It's a simpler more structured day we get breaks and stuff which is cool but i feel like i'm practicing more holistic arboriculture oh, okay. in a way because yep. i'm planting trees now we just started setting up like a tree planting site and then you know we'll go out and do like test samples we'll get oak wilt samples or go prune structural like small young shade trees and it, there's a whole bunch of stuff we're always going to workshops and seminars nice. and stuff training it's it's a really nice place to work because it the equipment's nice too and i'm around 50 60 other people in the field that like to do this work and are qualified competent yeah you know sane people for the most part i don't think every tree guy is necessarily 100 percent sane but yeah it's neither here nor there <laughs> but i mean like some of that charisma and the and the good stuff and the ideas and the creativity you know, I don't think I would trade it um, to get rid of all the depression, you know, mm. like there's the ups and the downs. Uh, so again, like I don't have bipolar as far as I know, but the bipolar is also called manic depressive disorder, correct? Mm -hmm. I used to work on the ambulance, so I, I pick up people who are having uh, difficult times with bipolar and it was some of the most difficult calls we had do. Yeah. Really, really tricky to try and talk to them or convince them to you know, yeah. allow us to help them or something. Right. Um, but some of the people, you know, they were, they were coping. Okay. We couldn't take them because they were still totally of sound mind in this, in this case. And, but they were like, they were saying some shit that I was like, it was like blowing my mind. And I was like, mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Like yep. we're treating bipolar. Like it's a bad thing, you know, same with schizophrenia, all these things, or it's just kind of like this light on a lot of mental health that it's, bad or negative, but I, you know, I don't think we fully understand a lot of them. And I think there's a lot of benefit. And I always, I was contemplating the other day, like maybe a lot of this mental health stuff too, is like, it's part of like the evolution of the human mind to a degree. And it just doesn't fit within the box of what society yeah. is now. So, you know, the majority rules and it's like, no, you're not doing things right. Let's control this or mm -hmm. let's, let's control this and, and put this, put this fire out because you know, you're getting something. A, you're getting a little too creative. So what is it? I got it? something for you. Okay. I got something. Am I still connected? No, I'm not. <laughs> you, got, right. you got your harness on. <laughs> yeah. I've been tinkering. Did I tell you I put a stripper pole in? No, you did not. You can't see it, but there's a stripper pole right here. 
and I have it rope tied off so I can go climb around. And then up there is a pull-up bar, so that's for redirects. Okay. What's the stripper pull for? Is it just an anchor? Uh, anchoring, yeah, <laughs> okay. just so I can, like, lean against it, you know? It's the best way I could do it without, like, drilling holes in the wall. We're not so going to see, like, book. a video of you that <laughs> spinning around and it's going to fall off the wall, like, all those stripper I was pull fails? It'd be like the most viral art video, just some dude breaking his back in his own apartment. It's basically a dorm <laughs> room that I live in. But yeah, dude, I can do whatever I want because I'm single. So I just put a stripper pole and a pull-up bar in for this. Okay. Right on. This book is about that, though. It's about, uh, is it backwards or do uh, I nope. see this backwards? Uh, it looks okay. okay the hip, you can read it. The hip. Hypomanic. Hip, hypomanic. Oh, I thought I was going to think say hypno because I've been doing hypno, but... The hypomanic, you hold it up again, I'll just read it out, everybody. Oh, now it's blurry, of course. Maybe you read it. The hypomanic edge, and it's basically talks about how a lot of successful people have these manic tendencies where yes, uh, it, it looks like some of the, it's what you're talking about, basically, where there's some behaviors that don't fit in the box. However, there's hyper creative, interesting people that don't mm -hmm. go with the flow of society necessarily. They have different work processes and just like a general energy they're hard to be around. Hypomatic This edge. book kind of outlines that. Like some of the most successful people are and creative people are have a tendency to have these personality traits. And it's, so to say someone is having hypomanic symptoms isn't necessarily mean they have bipolar disorder. It just right. like I have bosses that have hypomanic tendencies, yeah. but they don't have the depressions too. Okay. So that means they don't have bipolar. This is a part of being a human being is this to have makes sense, phases though. like this. People won't always hit the full manic state. Like manic mania is is like, I think I'm Jesus. I'm going to jump off this building because I can fly. You won't sleep for three, four days. Hallucinations, stuff like that. Hypomania yeah. is it kind of, I don't want to say a sweet spot because it, it can be a bad thing. Like yeah. this has definitely had a huge impact on my marriage is how much time I spent hyper fixating on things that weren't nearly as important because I was, you know, sleep deprived and constantly focusing on things I didn't need to. Um, and kind of stuck in my own head on stuff. So you get obsessed with things. And yeah, you get yeah. these energy spurts. And so human yeah. beings naturally get hypomanic. Not naturally, rather. Some people get hypomanic. It can be a benefit to success and creativity. Okay. I think that's what you were getting at. So this that's good. It's about that's that. probably and yeah, what I'm sort of describing when I'm when I'm saying like I don't I've never been diagnosed with bipolar. I don't think that I am because mm -hmm. I'm not that extreme, but I see a lot of tendencies, like you said. Um, I see a lot of similar tendencies that could be related to like bipolar or ADHD or whatever it is. And it's like, yeah. and I think that's why my brain also works differently and that I'm like this creator as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can see this broader picture of things and piece them all together and it makes so much sense and I can understand how other people think. And then it's almost like you can predict how something's going to go based on these behaviors or these things, how they're working out. And then you have all of these ideas and sometimes can stay up you know, all night with like a huge mm -hmm. idea or insight that comes in writing it all down. And, yep. and, you know, that could last maybe a, for me, it's like a day or two at the most, if that yep. long. Uh, but then it settles out. But then I do now expect a low phase to kind of balance it out, you know, and it's not hardcore, super low, like I'm going to be suicidal or something each time, but it's, mm. you know, it might be a day where I'm like, Ugh, no hope. Kind a of little thing. bit laggy. I see. A little bit laggy, but I mean, I wouldn't trade those days, like I was saying before, to get rid of the other extremes. So I feel like there's like a, a swing, like a pendulum that it just swings a little bit further than most people. And I think a lot of, yeah. you know, entrepreneurial type people, innovators, all these things, they get these ideas from these higher states, right? Mm -hmm. This higher states, I think, are connected to a greater consciousness and things like that that come in, that come to you. So, I mean, if someone thinks they're honestly Jesus, I don't think they're wrong. Like, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, like we're all, we're all one and like, depends on how you, how deep you want to go down the spiritual rabbit hole. But like, do you have that feeling? Like I've had some of those feelings say on psilocybin or something where you have like a temporary mm -hmm. experience with a med with medicine like that, then you have mm -hmm. complete understanding of probably what we're talking about. If anyone's ever done it, mm -hmm. um, it's just weird because there's no roadmap for a lot of this kind of stuff. And I really wonder a lot about it. Yeah. What, what, uh, what do you think about yourself? Like, as far as like, do you, do you think bipolar is, is a gift for you once you can, 
you know, manage it? Like, do you look at it as a negative? Do you, hmm. would you, would That's you trade it? Would you trade it if you, knowing what it's like now, if you could, do you resent it? Could you, would you wish you could go back and not have it? That's tough, you know, because like we're talking about, there are the upsides of some things. I mean, it definitely is part of the creative channel of energy, whatever, because it stokes the ebb and flow of that you know, energy, the things that you need inside of you to make things. There's like a certain amount of upwelling of exuberance or enthusiasm about something. And um, I think if you're not really in a state like that, you're not very receptive and just you can't have an upwelling of that. Yeah, let's do it. I think ambition exists within that hypomanic realm to a certain extent where I think about like movie directors. It's a miracle that movies get made at all. I mean, the type of movies where people are as a team write a thing and film a thing and edit a thing like major Hollywood productions are insane. And it's a miracle that they get made at all. Because there's too uh, many ideas and too many people thinking about what it's going to be like. You mean it's it's just the taking how much you need to coordinate and how much communication needs to happen. And yeah, it's a, like a, to understand each other well enough to work on a team like that and have the result not be a crazy mess. I thought that I actually too. kind of drifted away from my point there, and I forgot what it was. Something well, we we're talking about, about movies. We're we're talking about basically bipolar. Would you mm -hmm. go back? Gift. Do you yeah. think it's a gift? I don't know. I don't know if I can answer if it's. I could say right now it's both for sure, and I don't know if it's one or the other. Sometimes. I mean, I look at like this movie and I would think, you know, at, at times during those five weeks, I was definitely on a like a little mood upswing. Yeah. You know, there was a couple of nights where I didn't sleep like hardly much, you know, and I still went to work the next day and I was fine. But mm -hmm. uh, this is one of the best pieces of anything I've ever made ever. And I definitely think it was born out of these things that we're talking about right now. It's like these these different states of consciousness and human experience and the the reason i even bring it up is because no one wants to bring it up and talk about the difficult and the you know the more taboo fringe stuff the difficult parts of being a person and yeah yeah man it's there's so much we can explore and i don't think people really want to a lot of the time they just ignore the thoughts in their heads and they just go i'll just watch the bachelor and eat this uh carbohydrate whatever this is yeah people get really good at kind of halting them or covering them up and then and then and then self it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that they believe you know that they don't even have them anymore to a degree like they're you know quote asleep people people call it like and people think that their thoughts are all one-dimensional and that they are their thoughts you know as opposed to having different levels of consciousness like we said different states of consciousness whether it's through inebriation or having a manic day or a hypomanic, mm. whatever, matic, hypomatic experience. <laughs> but then, man, I've been having these experiences lately too. It sounds so woo woo, but like where it's like multidimensional in that sense where it's like, I'm, I'm the good, I'm the high, but I'm also like, I'm having the low at the same time. It's mm -hmm. like, and then I realized like the thought, there's different quality of thoughts. There's like the monkey mind, bullshit brain. It's like there's a devil and the angel on your shoulder. Then mm -hmm. there's like the guy who's watching the devil and the angel mm -hmm. have this conversation, who's observing it. And then there's like this guy who's receiving like an antenna, like these messages <laughs> from like the universe. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's like yeah. giving me like life purpose and direction in a good mm -hmm. way. You know, and there it's all happening at the same time. And you got to like... And then you got to be whatever the person is or whoever it is to discern all of this, to be like, oh, that's garbage. Mm -hmm. That's that's bullshit. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole and, and feel terrible for two days. Like, it's just monkey mind. And, and then you can adjust it with how you're eating and how you're, mm -hmm. you know, if you're working out or what you're doing and or what hat you got to put on that day you're at work. So it's like, no, I got to be I got to be uh, uh -oh. rational and functional. And we're going to think in this 3D mm -hmm. world of just getting stuff done. And then I can go home and I can dream about um, aliens, you know, when I before I go to bed or something. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> you know, <laughs> isn't everybody like this? Oh my god! And it's it's a complicated thing. It is. I, don't know. I like to think sometimes I have it figured out, and then I go, oh yeah, but I don't at all. 
you know. So do you ever right hit now, new I levels? think I have it figured out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. New levels? Like, do you ever Where hit I new think levels? I understand more. Yeah, or like a, new levels of insight or experience, or like a different type of maybe a hypomatic, you know, or mm -hmm. or a manic phase, or or something where it's just like a new understanding of yourself, and you hit like a new level of like consciousness or understanding yeah. like are you always kind of like adding on to the tools in your mental toolbox that's you know, different lenses of perspective or do you work on that sometimes, purposefully sometimes they're they, they improve like i can glean information and wisdom if i'm having a even the difficult depressive episodes you can learn stuff from just it's mm. not as often but i definitely i learn a lot about myself when i'm in the higher energy states for sure they mm. I don't know what it is. You're just more receptive to stuff. Yeah. More creative. Really, I can only describe the feelings. I don't really know why it happens or how it happens. And people have theories about like the lunar phases and stuff. Yeah. Because there's some research to suggest that people with bipolar disorder, their moods will fluctuate with the lunar like calendar. It's really weird. Yeah. Um, I know yeah, it is. I just it is weird, but I mean, it, it kind of makes sense. Like when you think about the simplicity of like life and organisms and gravitational forces and just how yeah. the universe operates with these energy fields and whatever it's mm -hmm. like just because we can't see this stuff or measure it maybe at least in our mm -hmm. three dimensions like doesn't mean it doesn't exist or have an influence yeah. over us or we're not called to learn more about it so i don't discount any of that stuff i'm i'm pretty woo-woo mm -hmm. off the deep end these days so. it depends on the day or, but i feel you man yeah i guess just open-minded because i'm still practical and rational and get stuff done and uh, yeah. can talk to a wide variety of people, I think, and, and kind of meet them where they're at, which I think is great, you know, but, uh, I'm definitely open and don't discount pretty much anything these days. I'm, you know, flat earth, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. That one comes up and I don't know, I don't know if I could wrap my head around that, but I mean, I, I don't get, understand I get where it. they're coming I get from. There. One day I, I had don't. a bit of a, a glimpse. I had a bit of a glimpse, like an insight kind of like I shifted like from someone's perspective of what someone would think like I don't think they're being like conspiracy theory um you know trying to you know get attention like not that kind of stuff but it was more like someone who actually believes it and why they would believe it that way and I kind of like had this glimpse of like an insight of just to why why that was happening and I was kind of like okay yeah. I, I kind of get it now it was it was fleeting so I don't remember the details but you know just seeing things from other people's perspective, I think, is valuable. Well, yeah, we're back around again, man. It's we want to understand each other. Like, even you, you can hate somebody, but I think, like, the more you dislike or like somebody, the you're gonna have an equal amount of fascination about them or like intrigue. Because I don't know about you, but when I meet people that are one way or another, either they're just total dicks or like they're super exuberant and positive, or maybe they're quiet and withdrawn. I just wonder why people are the way they are. Yeah. And it's not like I'm psychologizing them consistently. It's, it's a drive inside of me to want to understand them better. Mm -hmm. One, because we're working side by side every day. If it's someone that I have to see every day, I want to know them. Yeah. And two, I think by understanding other people, you understand yourself it's a pretty simple concept i think but we aren't anybody with anybody without anybody else if that makes sense like just there's no human in a vacuum but we all exist as like you said as one kind of and, and i think we, we balance don't exist each, each other. other yeah and i think we balance each other out like you're gonna have mm -hmm. people that are really energetic and people that are not and like <laughs> everyone has to fit as a puzzle piece into this you know life or whatever the heck's going on here it makes it all... fun all the yeah. personalities and all the that's why trees are cool right because they all have their different characteristics and the leaves are different and they grow in different spots it's the fascination of life in general it's everywhere life is everywhere and they complement each other like they can't mm -hmm. all be high canopy trees there's yeah. got to be trees in the middle there's got to be grasses there's got to be microbes and ferns fractals and hostas to destroy yeah <laughs> so can you tell me more about uh more practically speaking uh, you know, maybe people are, can relate to some of this kind of stuff or maybe they just, you know, they have bad days and they don't know what's going on. But what did you mm -hmm. find successful for you to get better? Like you've alluded to the fact that things were really bad for you, mm -hmm. right? And then now things are at the time, at least now, like better. So what, 
what do you attribute that to? Like, what did you do? Well, first things first, if you have a mental illness, don't drink alcohol. It's just not for years and years. I thought I could drink even in moderation being on these meds and it just doesn't work. Mm. It makes the medic. Like I actually learned down to like the uh, neuroscientific level, how this works, your brain like cannot properly do the things it needs to do to, to metabolize energy essentially because alcohol, even when you're not intoxicated is, is holding back a system in your brain. That's that helps it move better essentially. So it, you're not only poisoning your body, you're poisoning your mind. And so if you're taking medication or you get depressed, whatever, it's probably best not to mess with that particular substance. I think there are better alternatives if you're looking for a mood boost and whatever, but that's, I guess, another discussion for another time. I, I, the other thing too is yes, having a purpose and knowing what I wanted to do. That's why mm. I think arboriculture saved me because Really, even through all, all the difficult epochs that I've had over the past, you know, 10, 15 years, this is the thing that's always brought me back around. Like, even when I'm not doing really well, I'm still like, I like tree work and I'm still thinking about tree work and doing it and stuff. So it's, yeah. it's kind of a permanent facet in my life at this point. So I There's think if you can find there. that cornerstone, what was that? There's a draw there. That's something that draws us. And you talked about that in your documentary, like why a boar culture? You're like, are we under their care or are we caring for them? Oh, yeah. You That's know, a and poem it's... by Zach Martin. And okay. uh, he makes a really good point, man. That guy, uh, that, uh, I think about that poem every day. And the minute he sent me that and I listened to his, I was like, this is going in the beginning immediately. It's like the best poem I had heard in like a long time. That was so good. But yeah, dude, are they, under, are they caring for us or are we caring for them? There's a, there's some poignance to that. So th think about it. And yeah it's deep and it's why like what is it about it that draws us like for me i needed to find a new career and all of a sudden like i came across an arborist and it like just hit me like a ton of bricks and i'm like i have to do this mm -hmm. like where mm -hmm. did that feeling come from why did... and it's kept keeps coming up that like the the uh metaphors of like how we're connected to trees and just being out there and i feel, i really feel like it was this weird gift that yeah. was given to me uh mm -hmm. i don't know why i almost can't explain it but like it was part of my journey to be outside with the trees, learning about it, connecting mm -hmm. to nature. I mean, people talk about earthing and forest bathing and whatever, but there's something mm -hmm. there that's drawn us out there. Like, what do you think that is? Hmm. Like I was talking about discomfort. There's some folks that are really, really averse to it. They just want to find a nice comfy spot and not challenge themselves and, feel pain in any regard. I think some people are a little, I don't want to say say to masochistic, but some people realize and utilize that pain and actually kind of chase after those experiences that are difficult because they know at the end of it, it's going to feel nice to have conquered something difficult. It's, hard. it's yeah, it's something about it though. So yeah. stopping drinking, I agree, is huge. I had a problem with mm -hmm. drinking as well, especially during the hard times to cope. And I heard a good, a good quote or something it was one time it was like drinking now or today is like stealing tomorrow's happiness for now you know yeah. so it's like that's what it does and then you're okay now and then you're gonna have to kind of pay the piper after and if you yeah. do it all the time Dude. it's like exactly there's a freaking i was waking up in the morning and i had like the shakes you know mm. Yeah, and so I end up having to go like delirium the hospital. Tremens. If you, the delirium tremens, yeah, and you can have seizures and stuff. And mm -hmm. I'll spare you the details, but yeah, it's bad. You can you can get in a really tough spot trying to withdraw from alcohol on your own. Yeah, and so yeah, exactly. Just the next day, you are robbing yourself. You're robbing yourself of any positive experience that could have been better. You've ruined by and, trying to steal it, essentially. And it blows my mind that like out of all the drugs in the world, like alcohol is the worst and it's like proven to be the worst. It has like no therapeutic benefit really. And it's the legal one that exists everywhere yeah. because we can tax yeah. it and make money off it and whatever. Yeah. Like, and yeah. why, why, who's like, what is this happening? But then like <laughs> every other drug, well, cannabis, psilocybin, you make, LSD. No kidding. There's so many better things if you're trying to explore yourself. 
I think uh, alcohol is definitely a if you're well if you're gonna have some connection from it it's with drinking with other people but there's nothing therapeutic about drinking alone in my opinion and yeah. not in the way that I was doing it you know what I mean so it's, yeah there's consequences to it how did you uh just as another aside here but how did you find success in quitting alcohol oh well, the first thing i needed to do is completely reset my environment and so i got everything kind of fell apart like my wife left i lost my house um lost the job and i was like well i have no ties here anymore when i just like to just completely stop I'm going to get out of here and just reset everything. So like the environment I was in, the people I was around knew. So new influences, new everything. And I was just trying to get back on a, the day-to-day -day of how to care for yourself, how to eat and sleep and go to AA meetings and just like live a structured, regular life. Build some routine um, and structure, but yeah. In in a new environment to take home. I didn't expect I'd come back to Minnesota, but when I did decide I was going to leave Florida, and come back home i was like i have to make sure that i'm in a spot here where i'm ready to go and continue growing i'm not just going to get there and then relapse immediately and so yeah it being being in a new environment getting away from you know this house where i had just been drinking and drinking for years i would have just continued to drink if i slipped stayed in that house i think yeah because you stare at walls long enough and they become familiar to you and you tend and to want to stay there this film mm -hmm. had a impact on you as far as like giving you a creative outlet too to kind of yes use your brain in that yep. different way exercise it in a different way and fill mm -hmm. your time up like oh well, yeah that helped a lot <laughs> yeah yep it's like finding a hobby essentially for people out there it's the simplest way to put it yeah i mean to find some folks just need a little something like they could just sew and then or like knit or whatever, just lightly. And that's fine. Some people need a hobby, but they need a hobby. Like, yeah, I just met some dude the other day. He was really into RC cars. And like, he's like, check this out. He opens his garage door and it's just like shelves and shelves and <laughs> shelves of batteries and remote controls. And I'm like, this is my shit. This is the kind of guy I am. But with tree climbing gear and stuff like, yeah, yeah. you know, I, like, there's I get a it. certain <laughs> spirit. Yeah, I get it, man. And I love that people that are nerds and they don't care. Yeah, about, I love know, meeting people just, that are like so hardcore about yeah. something and just like, and I don't mm -hmm. know anything about it, but I just love knowing the fact that they are like an expert of whatever that is. Yeah. So it's just like, okay, teach me about the RC cars. <laughs> I don't know anything and about And then to them. see someone excited about something, like just, yeah. that gen just generally seeing smiling, happy people. And then if someone's talking about something they like to do, it's probably brought them a lot of fulfillment. So they might have information for you that could be, like pivotal almost like if I hadn't listened to the little voice in my head saying like, Hey, you know, go try tree work. Cause it looked interesting. Right. Cause I just saw a crew one day kind of working. I did landscaping and then one day we did tree work and I saw climbing for the first time. I saw crane work for the first time. And I was like, well, I don't really want to be a neuroscientist or whatever I was going to school for. It, it took me away and I wanted to come home immediately and do it. So hmm. people, yeah, if you uh, exuberant, happy people that are like really into what they do, I love that. Watching someone geek yeah. out about something—that's yeah. why YouTube and the internet's great. It's just—it's perfect oh, environment to do that. We're doing it right now. Yeah, just niche stuff. Uh, yeah. Do you find? Uh, you said you mentioned AA. Mm -hmm. I mean, finding that community. I guess I don't know. I always had this thought in my mind too. If I was like an alcoholic, I didn't want to stop drinking. I'm like, I'm not going to AA. I don't want to like hang out with sober people and whatever i'm just gonna do it on my own mm. but looking kind of back now i'm just like you know it makes a lot of sense though you you need a community you need to kind of create a new one it may not work for everybody but i think there's a bit of a structure there especially if you have you're starting from nothing not that i've gone but i've heard a bit about it was that a big part for you like do you go regularly do you have a lot of friends no. there I went to AA like the first three months i lived in florida i went to like two meetings a day sometimes and I found it helpful. I liked the people. The structure was good, et cetera. But there are some things about it that I don't necessarily agree with how they, how they approach addiction and like their philosophy on it. Generally speaking, I you know it's a, it's a, it's a proven system. This, uh, hold on. I was going to talk about like, it's a philosophical thing, okay? They want you yeah. to be 100% sober, and I, on occasion, like to use cannabis for self-exploration, sleep, mm. whatever. 
Right. And so I felt like a hypocrite in a way, continuing to sometimes use cannabis and going there and acting like I was a sober, sober person. Mm -hmm. And so I still call myself sober now. I just don't drink the thing that was harming me. But right. in terms of other substances, um, in that regard, that's why I didn't like AAs because I thought it was it's a very helpful therapeutic thing to use in moderation. And for them to just discount every substance without considering, you know, personal experience with it and then also uh, science around it. Like uh, alcohol and cannabis are not the same thing. No. And it's like just because something changes your state of consciousness doesn't mean they're the same <laughs> thing. Right. Like you can't just be yeah. like throw the baby out the bathwater and be like you drink, you have an, you're an addict. So now you can't do anything. It's like, well, you can't gamble. Mm -hmm. You can't stare at your phone. Like there's a bajillion addictions out there. It's a, yeah. it's a type of behavior. You could be addicted to anything, yeah. but, but, but like over here, it's like, no, you can be addicted to TikTok, Wyatt, but yeah. you can't, you can't be, you can't be using cannabis once in a while. Cause like, oh. that's the slippery slope. It, it, I agree. It doesn't make sense. Like people need to dis obviously decide for themselves as well. So I also don't agree with that. It was, it's an interesting collection of folks and a lot of amazing success stories and stuff. And I have, I'm not taking any way, anything away from that program. In fact, it's, it's time tested. It's been around for over a hundred years. The story of how AA came to be is a really cool story actually. Mm -hmm. And it's been helping people for so long. Um, I have nothing against it. I just think I needed this something a little different. And it gave me like some training wheels to start yeah. my, my, my little journey on the, how to not drink anymore. So That's a good, I don't, I don't really know if I'd call it sobriety because I still have a part of me that I don't understand. And I feel like through kind of opening certain gateways, so to speak, yeah. like with what, what cannabis and psilocybin can do, for instance, yeah, you can learn stuff about yourself that you can't otherwise. And so I, like you said, the baby with the bathwater, it just changes your consciousness. Sure. So it doesn't mean that it's bad. Like human beings, a lot of animals have this natural tendency to want to change their consciousness. And there's nothing wrong with that, but yeah. we've criminalized it essentially, or, you know, it, it's been, it's been looked down upon the, to change your consciousness and outside of your... grinding and being a fucking workhorse, you know? And changing your consciousness could be different types of consciousness and it can be changed in different ways. So they could be completely different things. We, I don't think we should group them all together. Like Fair. you could, you could lay, you could do hypnosis for like a, a personal therapeutic treatment. And that is a state, a different state of consciousness that you put yourself in. And that's not bad, right? People don't generally think of that as bad. So I think people just need to, you know, search inside themselves and go by their heart and their gut feeling of what they think is right for them. And I think this is a big problem with our lives and, and in general is that we all put so much merit in everyone else's rules and boundaries and the way we're supposed to live. Like you're supposed to go to school and then you're supposed to go to university and then you're supposed to work nine to five till you're 65. Like these are all just guidelines. You know, you can do... Mm -hmm what you want you create your own reality literally and if you don't like it then then change it and but at the same time you said aa it's like it may work awesome for somebody but it might not work at all for another alcoholic you might find benefit in doing a psilocybin trip or iboga and like and then mm. never touch it again that might work for them and uh or it might work for you temporarily just to get you those those training wheels like you said and you go off everything you kind of reset and mm -hmm. then maybe you think, hey, well, cannabis is different. Uh, I'm going to try it out. It works for me. I have positive experiences. I don't have the negative sides to it. And like chemically, it affects you differently too. So if you're into mm -hmm. science and stuff like that, that can prove it there as well. But not that I'm encouraging yeah. people to go do cannabis. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's I mean, touchy, whatever. You know, too. A lot of people have commercial driver's licenses and stuff. And, you know, it's, it's a frown upon in the industry, even if it's, something you're doing outside of work, they don't care. You can drink to your hearts to the light and come in hung over. And I mean, they still care, but it's not the same thing if you piss hot. You know yeah. what I mean? And you have a commercial driver's license. It's just a different animal, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah everyone's got so, their own thing. And then I think everybody needs to be respected for their own choices too. Right? Yeah. Like, um, you mentioned psilocybin. Do you, have you tried psilocybin for, for therapeutically? 
yeah, I a couple of years ago, I I had like a couple of experience with it, and it was really nice. It was interesting, um, enlightening, and hmm. it just made me really emotional. I remember too, to just kind of go through this gamut of uh, like nostalgia and you know a lot of introspection and stuff like that. But it wasn't like some crazy like, whoa, this is chippy. Would it ever yeah seeing colors like movies and stuff portray it? It was just more of an inward kind of reading the inside of my mind kind of a thing. Yeah. Wandering around. And it was good. I liked the way that it was really gentle. It wasn't so like sporadic hmm. and uh, jarring because I've had, uh, well, I've never had this experience, but ayahuasca, like the DMT realm experiences. Yeah. I've heard some crazy stories about what that's like. I don't know. I didn't feel like that. And I, I enjoyed still being on earth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, the reason I was wondering, and maybe yeah. you can shed some light on this, is that when I first got into researching psilocybin, I kind of researched it myself personally for about a year before I, I mm -hmm. kind of had the courage and decided it was something I wanted to try therapeutically. Um, was that people with, like, say, schizophrenia, and I think bipolar was on the list, is that it was contraindicated. Oh, yeah. And if you take oh. SSRIs, not to take it, so... Mm. Again, I don't believe in all black and white, but what do you think about that? That's tough, right? Because uh, how psilocybin affects the brain, it's the same chemical system, so serotonin. And you can, well, one, you cannot really get the effects. Like, you won't get as much positive benefit from using psilocybin if you're on medications. Like, the reason I couldn't go do ayahuasca is because I was on lithium. You know what I mean? And so yeah. that's... It, there's just some things I'm not going to experience. I've heard there's blockages. I can't recommend it to everybody. Yeah. Say I've heard again. like some of those medications and things like, yeah, block the pathway. So you just kind of almost don't get exactly. the experience. It just kind of makes it. Exactly. I just got the puking oh. from my office. Yeah. Oh, awesome. So. I did Iboga yeah. one time and I, I puked for like mm. 24 hours straight. Yeah, that's I've heard about that. Hardest <laughs> thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. I don't even know honestly what the benefit was from it in the end. I <laughs> it didn't just have, sucked. <laughs> it just it was just something hard to do, I think maybe, so that one mm -hmm. you know, when shit got hard out in a tree mm -hmm. and it was cold, my fingers were freezing, I'd just be like, Ah, it's not as bad as I boga was. <laughs> have you seen those guys? There's this freaking they stick their hand in like a glove full of fire ants. Some tribe somewhere, South Central America or whatever, but they'll just God. like stick their hand in there full of fire ants and they'll just dance around with it smiling and then they take it off and their arms all puffy and shit <laughs> crazy jesus they, there's a, they like pain there's a level out there i think that's accessible that uh yeah goes mm -hmm. beyond pain that's pretty high level i think from the stuff yeah. that i've read about or studied but i mean it's possible i guess they're proving it but so uh, have you done uh psilocybin a few times or just one time yeah you with a handful Two times, once with a friend, and then once by myself. And yeah. oh, he didn't have a sitter or anything. Just, yeah, once with a friend, yeah, I had a sitter for once, but it's all right. You know, I wouldn't. I don't really feel like doing it again, to be honest. I don't like the experience of eating them. That was pretty bad. I don't really not into yeah. the taste. Oh, and they're they are non-addictive. Like that, they're the yeah. they're the opposite of addictive. It's a I don't know. For my experience. The last thing you think about, like, when's the next time I'm going to do mushrooms is the last thing on your mind when you've just done mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. And it's lasted for me. It's yeah. lasted for years. I'm just like, I don't think yeah, I'm going back in there. I don't think I'm going back in. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back in, but I don't know what the experience uh -huh. is going to be like. And it could be, it could be anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's cool though. Um, but cannabis, I love I love cannabis and I think there is a lot of therapeutic value in it. I think I've mentioned to you, but I, I just did a podcast with um, a lady who's going to, I think she's trained as a sitter for different psychedelics, including cannabis. And then she's going to be starting a cannabis uh, kind of like business, like a life coaching, uh, a sitting thing for, for people that want to do cannabis. Cause like cannabis is, you know, somewhat newly legal in Canada and, mm -hmm there's a lot of people that grew up with it being like, you know, the devil. So yeah. they could be in their fifties and sixties and they want to try it, but they're a little bit scared. I don't know. And then, so she's I think going to do sessions with like couples and 
especially like older couples that want to try it and then and focus on like the spiritual internal aspects of it and i think intention is huge so if your intention is to work on yourself and connect with someone and then you do it you uh, that goes a long way you know not to say it's bad to like do with friends and and just laugh your head off too like but that's kind of where your intention lies. Do you uh, do you have different experiences with cannabis, like by yourself compared to like mm-hmm. with other yeah, people? I'm like, do you get on my own? Yeah, it's fun to do with other people, but it just depends on who. Either way, I think a lot of the personally, a lot of the growth that I experience on my own is on my own, like personal growth. Yeah, and realization of that growth happens on my own because you kind of have to take a moment. And look at the day or the week and go, what have I not only accomplished, but what are some problems that have popped up that I think I need to work on or whatever? You're just mm. kind of taking back and taking a step back and looking at yeah. everything from a bird's eye view a little bit. And that's one of those things. Yeah, it kind of helps you do that. Hey? It's like a yeah, a self-reflection type mm-hmm. thing. And you can kind of decide where you want to go and navigate with it. But it's really cool. It kind of gets rid of a little bit of that attachment maybe or like emotion yeah. around it where you can more objectively yes. kind of look at yourself and then man yeah. you get some I, crazy insights and ideas too sometimes it really helps with that exactly the problem is the memory issues i have with it i find myself going on a tangent in my mind and going this is really cool this is really cool and even if i'm writing it down i'm just like oh there it goes it's like trying to catch mm. salmon with a butterfly net you know what i mean they're just swimming by and you're just swinging yeah. this shitty net you can't catch them um but that's like, what I, yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's like built into us too. We have a whole endocannabinoid system. It suggests that we evolve to, you know, live with this plant and consume it. Yeah. We have receptors that accept it. Yeah, dude. And it's how cool. cool is that psilocybin and like cannabis, like they're frigging plants, man. Mm-hmm. Like, how can you make a plant illegal? You know, know. <laughs> like so, uh... it just, it just grows. It's meant for us. Do you ever grow? Have you ever grown it? Mm-mm. I've definitely been interested. It's just, you know, I live in a one bedroom apartment in a not so legal state. Oh, okay. I mean, no, we're, we're recreational legally now in Minnesota, but like, I don't know if I should just be growing it. I don't even think my apartment would be cool with that. And I don't know how to hide the smell. I don't really want to do, do that here. I don't think so. Yeah. No worries. Go find some train tracks and throw some seeds down or something and see if that works. <laughs> Probably not. You could gorilla grow, yeah. Gorilla yeah, we grow. have a, that's what they call it, yeah, if you do it out in the bush somewhere. <laughs> I like it. Hopefully you get back there before some kids do. But yeah, we grow some here in our basement, like by the furnace. It's like in the tent. There's a cool. carbon filter and stuff on it, so it, it filters out like the smell. Mm-hmm. Except this one time I, I was drying it and I drew it in the furnace room and then my wife was at work and then it just filled the house. It was so strong and it was just started, the furnace would go on and just pumped it through the house. Ooh, it's all warm too. Uh, yeah, she, she wasn't too thrilled. But uh, anyway, the carbon filter thing works great now. I love it. I think I sent you a picture, I think. Hey, of, uh, yeah, you did. That whole so system, mu- that little tent. Oh yeah, Pretty it's cool. so much fun. Just... Uh, you know, it takes like three months with an auto flower and just mm-hmm. going in there and like babying it and talking to it and mm-hmm. giving it some water and whatever. Uh, there's something different about it. Like I've found when you kind of grow it yourself and look after it and then, I don't know, it gives you, I think it just gives you like some different vibe and different thoughts mm-hmm. when you've done it yourself. But anyways, I'm pretty pro cannabis. I think it's a pretty harmless uh, molecule or whatever you want to call it. Makes everybody happy and hug. Yep. Um, what did you learn from making this documentary? What's it your big takeaways? One is, I mean, a lot of the subject matter in it, like I was saying, was difficult to talk about, but there's so many other people. I get 10 to 40 new messages a day from people who have seen it really? and have something. I mean, there's a core group of people here, you included, of like the people I talked to on Instagram, Brian Brock and, uh, you know, like Levi, uh, what all. And yeah, you know, new people that I don't even know have, have said they've had, they've been receptive to it and have gleaned something or can relate to it in some way. So that's the first thing I learned is one is I'm definitely not alone. Mm. And that's part of why I made it is because I see that I'm not alone, but no one wants to talk about the fact that they're, you know, I just went through a messy divorce and I've been trying to drink myself to death every night, but I have to come in and work here, you know, 
high power, high tension power lines and at height. I mean, if there can't even be a conversation, if we're all just going to avoid it, you know, so that's why I made it. And that's what I learned is that I'm not, I'm not on my own with this. And there's more people that I can talk to about it and help. Second, um, I'm more productive than I thought I could be. I usually find that my creative process is kind of sporadic and I don't really have a, have a plan. And you know what I did this time is I bought whiteboards and I made post-it notes and stuff. And I started yeah. going through all my files and like organizing stuff before I made the timeline. And I, I like kind of redefined for myself what I can be creatively. I'm not just like crazy all over the place throwing paint anymore guy. I yeah. like to have like at least an outline and then go crazy with the paint. That's how this movie came to be. And so I learned that, yeah, if I can have a bit of a process, that's a little more refined. I can make yeah. so much stuff. Like if I could get this system down, I could be like a real content creator where like yeah. videos come out every week and I'm like, subscribe and stuff, you know, and actually make a, a following and maybe make it income somehow. So that's the other thing I learned too, is I really would like to do this for a living and still remain in Arbor culture because I love being behind the camera and just holing up in the lab and editing, man. I like, I like this a lot messing with colors and the video and editing. It's just, so if, if anything else, the other thing I learned is that it's solidified for me that filmmaking is the other component to my life. It's like tree work and that creative component that mixes with it. So I understand the balance of what, what I should be doing with my time. And I, I think it's doing tree work and being behind a camera because they, they have led me nowhere but up. Do you think that's your, or have you explored that question of like what your life purpose would be? Do you believe in life purpose or uh, you think you've, mm sort of honed in on it now and, and found it or you're on that path starting out? Yeah. Yeah. Like the initial thing answer I want to say is, yeah, I found my purpose. It's tree work, but that there's a, whatever activity you could say fills that hole. That's not the meaning. The meaning isn't tree work. It's, it's more at the risk of sounding pretentious, but sophisticated than that yeah. about what makes a meaningful life and a mean meaningful or nuanced career more nuanced. Yeah, exactly. There's more to it than can really be explained in a short amount of time either. Can you repeat your original question? Just like, do you think, have you found your life purpose? Do you think, Okay. do you believe in like a life purpose? And Sure. So yeah. Okay. And I and how would you define stuff. that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more complicated than just saying whatever it is. It's so like, uh, it's uh, doctors, people that help people that's at the core of their, mm. whatever it is that they do. Like that's a, that's a component of the purpose. Yeah. It's a, it's a whole experience though. Like there's the feeling of fulfillment, the reasoning behind why you feel fulfilled. And that's a whole other umbrella of reasoning too. Like it, it all comes back to what you value, who you surround yourself with. It's just, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of things that add up to this thing we call fulfillment. And so I, I like to say I understand what my purpose is. I just think I know what it is now. Anybody that says they understand and know exactly what's going on is full of shit and avoid those people. Because I don't know about you, but like I only know, I, I know I know this much. And there's just an infinite amount of knowledge and things I don't know out there. And so I don't try to go into life thinking I know and I'm confident about everything. I try to go in with like a genuine sense of curiosity and like, yeah. I want to learn about other people and myself, but it's, oh man. <clears throat> what, yeah. what else would you like to do? Like, do you think you'll be doing tree work forever? Do you think you'll I'd like to think I'm going to be in the industry? Yeah. But I don't know if I'll be doing the field work forever. I think it's just inevitable. You eventually <laughs> phase out of it. So that's what I like about the creative stuff is I think I can be a filmmaker through elder years too, if I really wanted to, would you and like it to could explore... help me expand. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, would you like to explore that, the film, uh, the film stuff, maybe like transition out of tree stuff a little bit, maybe and expand on that in different yeah, kind of. genres? Like, is there, what else interests you outside of tree work that you would music love to videos. film? I want to make hip hop music videos. Oh, yeah. Yeah, dude. Sweet. Cause I think I can make some crazy. If I just had the resources and like a bunch of friends to egg me on on my crazy ideas, dude, I can make some cool 
so I love hip hop videos. If you ever you see music videos, there's just a, there's a million <laughs> things you can do with them. They don't need to make sense. And that's perfect for me because nothing it's like swimming around in here ever makes sense most of the time. And so I just like I love yeah. hip hop, dude, hip hop and their music videos. That's what I want to do is work with producers and hip hop artists and make their music videos. <laughs> cool. You should I do it, man. Cool. Do you know anybody that, that, that yeah. does it? You could do it for? Nope. Nope. I don't know any rappers, any producers. Well, I don't either, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could put a list on or a Craigslist or a Kijiji or something or sure. Facebook ads. Looking to, make, looking to make a video. Yeah. Cool, dude. It's all, yeah, it's all in the tree. Like I film on a hip hop guy, put him in a harness. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, just. Trust Tangents. me, dude. Trust me. It's going to be it's awesome. Like, I'm scared. I can't flow right now. I can't flow. Okay. Well, um, is there anything else you'd like to kind of add or say out there? Maybe something we haven't, is there anything we haven't touched on? <laughs> it's pretty heavy on the mental like health. You. This one, I but... like you, Kurt. That's what I want to say. I like you a <laughs> Thanks, lot. Man. And I, I, the other day, I, uh, when you hit me up, I, I dug through your page again. And I remember why. I thought it was cool when I saw you on Instagram for the first time, because you do a really interesting flavor of our culture where instead of cutting the tree down because it looked like it's old and decrepit, you try to make it safe again and make it like a, look at trees more of a, a as a long term investment and not, you know, like an inconvenience or a hazard. You can mitigate it to still keep the tree, you know, so your regenerative arboricultural thing, it, it got me thinking yeah. about, you know, like every single time we take the spar down to the ground. Like you could at least leave habitat or something that seems to be within the realm of what you do. And I really respect that because it's at the forefront of the progression of our industry, instead of just the, the cut, cut, cut kind of lack of scientific things. Yeah. Now we know about mature veteran trees and retrenchment pruning. And it seems like you're applying that stuff more so than any other I mean, I know there's plenty of other people that do it, but you seem to be the best example of it in my little circle. So I like you, Kurt. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> a lot, dude. <laughs> yeah, I like what you're doing for the industry, and your podcast is cool, and Sweet, you're very uh, clean and organized, and just the, the, you know, I dig the mustache, your whole energy and everything. <laughs> so you, you, along with a lot of other people here on this community, this Instagram community, I, you're another one of those people that I really want to meet. So... I, yeah. I wouldn't mind flying to Canada. I know I make fun of Canada all the time because oh. y'all sound funny and your cops are on horses. But... Yeah, usually. <laughs> they, they have the car version now? Unless cool. it's too icy. But, Unless uh, it's too icy. Or they got studded horseshoes. Yeah, well, I've seen a Clyde still fall over. It's hilarious. Anyway. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, um, man, it's yeah. Uh, it's different. I sometimes feel like a bit of an imposter, honestly, in the mm. arboriculture culture industry because I'm pretty new to it. It's only been the last five years. I met Johnny Corthius and like some pretty rock star arborists to learn from up here. But uh, I took the fast train and worked alone a lot. And, you know, so mm. I kind of feel like Instagram's helping me kind of get in with the crowd of arborists out mm -hmm. there in the world. But, you know, so many people are like, competition climbers and mm -hmm. doing epic trees and rigging and that's kind of like what arbor culture is shown to the public as mm -hmm. you know or arbor cult or arborist fails that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. i feel like i'm just doing my own thing over here like uh in a different way so it's kind of cool you say it's like the forefront i think it is too i think it's going to be more important i don't know in the future i hope it becomes more important i really like permaculture and things too and how just trees tie into nature and us as humans like kind of like we discussed a little bit and uh how important all these systems are and how a tree as a climax species mm -hmm. you know it looks like just a tree but there's a lot more to it a lot more going on yeah. and i think that needs to be respected and mm -hmm. recently man it's not good for business but i've almost had like some more connection like i always know trees are living things right but it mm -hmm. kind of like hit me the other day like i kind of embodied the actual feeling of like this is like a, you know, somewhat, you know, quote, conscious, like living thing. Sentient. You can't talk to me, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, shit, this is making it really hard to cut a tree down. Mm -hmm. Like I'm having some like, you know, guilt around it. And uh, it's hard to convince people in five minutes not to cut their tree down and to prune it instead. Mm -hmm. 
you know, or to get over the fact that they don't want to climb on the roof and clean out their gutters. You know, it's like, just fucking get up there and clean it out. Like, you want to kill this tree because of that? And then what do I do? I say, would I say no and they just call someone else? Or do I do it and accept the job? So That's what makes it more admirable that you you choose to approach the business in this way is because I got to be honest, I think you probably lose a lot of business, right? Because you have to explain <laughs> to people, you know what I mean? You probably lose them. Because and they it's feel like they're being for, judged. Yeah. Exactly. And it's like, well, I, you know, you, you call a professional to give them, give you your professional opinion. If they, if you don't like the answer they give you, they'll go to somebody else either looking for another price or just, they want the answer to be, okay, here's the removal price. And then. They don't yeah. want you to talk about the science behind and the value of the tree and all that. They just want their gutters to not be dirty. So yeah. they're not big green rocks. People treat trees like they are. And you can just do whatever to them. Disposable. Or just like this, yeah, disposable fixture of the landscape that can be manipulated or like forced into being whatever we want them to be. And we're trying to just like live together peacefully. And that's part of what we do. It's just like help bridge the gap between the relationship of trees the public and human beings and all that yeah and that's got to speak for them for sure that was one of the things i want to bring up we are the advocates the trees we're the first line and the last line right and no one really talks about that in a board culture that when you show up and you look at someone's tree like you're the only thing standing between them and cutting it down when they call Mm -hmm. you for and they may not even really want to cut it down or know there's other options so i think it's really important that we explain all of the other options to them so at least they Mm -hmm. understand maybe understand a bit of the biology and like how important a tree actually is before they make that decision i know it takes a few extra minutes but i think Mm -hmm. it's our duty to do that because if we don't we're also the last line and no one's holding us you know to some sort of standard if we cut that tree down that we shouldn't have done it and they're going to go you're going to go through some review process that you cut down too many trees that shouldn't have been cut down it's like no you can just show up and cut it down and carry on with your life and make a bunch of money and mm-hmm. uh yeah so this is one of the reasons i started at most tree it uh it helps with the guilt on the on the client and and myself and i know it's inevitable to run a business i'm gonna have to cut trees down that i don't personally mm-hmm. want to cut down and do it for people it's just it's part of the job i try and reduce it as best i can so i can live with myself but at least we can <laughs> we can plant a couple more with that most tree with people that are that are involved mm-hmm. we plant two trees for each removal we do and it's like a voluntary like taxation basically on the on the trees cool. i don't know if you'd ever heard of it or not but yeah it just it just started it it's like i got like 30 35 companies now signed up we charge in canada 25 dollars, 20 dollars in the u.s um to people that want a tree removed like we commit to it so it goes on their bill it's not very much and then that funds planting of two trees off-site somewhere so we can that's advertise rad. that we're planting more than we're removing so that's yeah. great it's seedlings but i mean it's it's something and we all pool the the funds together you know i manage them and then we are planting arborist forests essentially mm-hmm. so yeah arborist forests arborist forests that's uh i like it yeah this is and this is all this all came to me one night too like we were talking mm-hmm. about like ideas in those states and I was mm-hmm. I asked I wanted to figure out what my life purpose was and I think I kind of put it out there to like you know the ether <laughs> whatever mm-hmm. be like what should I be doing with my life here I don't know and then think, the idea dude, you for- owe yourself that you owe yourself that if you have an idea sometimes you just go oh that's too grandiose and big and you just kind of shove it off to the side just like have the conversation with yourself what would it be like if I ran my own business that was sustainable or more about permaculture Instead of just cutting trees down, you had this conversation with yourself, and sometimes it goes, "Oh, ooh, I'm onto something," and then that oh, yeah. feeling that'll keep you up at night. That's Dude, exactly what creative people are, are like. That night I was get you. huge, and it was mm-hmm. like it was like perfect. The stars aligned. I could see. I could mm-hmm. do it right away. It was so simple. It solved every problem. Basically, you know, it checked all the boxes, and it was something I could scale up. I could do it on my own. I could. Oh yeah, it was it was beauty. Like it all came in one night. I stayed yeah. up and do, 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 wrote it all down. So and Great. now now the hard work, right? Now it's putting those <laughs> ideas into action, and it, mm-hmm. it takes overcoming the glitches and getting people to help you and collaborating and fighting yeah. through the tech and starting a podcast to ultimately build a yeah. brand and get the awareness out there and mm-hmm. connect with other people. Like, yeah, it's cool, man. I appreciate you we listening. We have a cool thing. We do. We have a cool thing. 
We do. Very, we do. very blessed. We're totally different kinds of arborists, but mm-hmm. at the core, we're the same. I do. That's, <laughs> that's exactly. Yeah. That's right. We're all family and to a certain extent, even the dude that's still spike pruning trees. I don't like it. I don't support that. But there's some, <laughs> yeah, I thought, it's, except it's, the spike like, pruners. <laughs> like down to the core of it, it's like people that work at height. Like I even see rope access people, and I explain this in the movie about it. Working at height inherently is dangerous, and it puts us human beings in a, in a place just to begin with where we're already at a high stress level. And that's why arborists are pretty incredible, is because we each day have to deal with this constant underlying fear and tension of the danger and everything. So we we have a crazy thing ahead of us most days and so yeah it's it's interesting yeah it's interesting those connections i agree i i just can't i can't believe some of the places and things i've been and seen doing tree work like going to oregon i went to oregon and i got to go to uh, jim belushi's cannabis farm for a tree competition and film it like i've just been places and seen things and met people you know like I, I'm 31, I could die tomorrow and be pretty happy with the things I've done with my life. Especially after this last little bit of getting over some pretty horrible stuff, I think oh, I'm yeah. a winner for the most part. But it, if I could continue, I'd like to. But at at this moment, I can look back at my career and go, "Damn, that was a good time." And I learned a lot. It was difficult. It was amazing. It was everything. It was yeah. the whole human experience, and it's the stuff I needed to be where I am today. But like I said, I could just. It could be over in, in a couple seconds, and I'd I'd be satisfied with the time I've spent here on Earth. And not nice a lot man. of people can say that. That was hard to, you know. That's a that's a thing I never thought I'd be able to say. As I sit in my like sad single guy divorced dorm room, with a freaking stripper pole and a rope hanging from the ceiling and stuff. <laughs> like I live my life the way I want to. It's gone the way it has, but I can't just sit here and you know. I, I do count my blessings, despite the fact that I live a very simple. You know, I'm rebuilding my life. I used to be a homeowner and I had like a savings account and stuff. And now I'm, you know, I'm just like back being in college kind of, but uh, there's a freedom to it of resetting your life, you know? So it's, yeah, I respect that. It's all right. I kind of, I crave that sometimes. I uh, I kind of often wonder what it would be like to kind of, I don't know, just well de- detach and, and get rid of a lot and just go back to the basics and see, build mm-hmm. it up, you know? It's not well, easy, I wouldn't think, but <clears throat> if uh, if this life journey was easy to get easy for everyone to get better and and uh, get over mm-hmm. a lot of these mental health things, whatever you know, everyone would do it. And it's these rock bottom moments often that trigger a lot of people to make huge changes and explore themselves and learn and ask these big existential questions questions and uh, try and find answers and gives them meaning in life. And uh, yeah, it's really cool, really cool. Mm-hmm. I hope everyone has that to some to some degree, at least some point in their life. You're only 31, I think it's only so like, necessary. yeah, you've learned a lot 31. already. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, no, it's been good, it's been bad, it's been everything. So. Sweet, but good and bad is just a label that we apply to things. What is good and bad? Yeah, you know? it's just life. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Just experience, good, bad, or ugly. Okay, buddy, <laughs> <laughs> we did it over two yeah, hours. Dude. Nail it, man. Thank you for having me on. And I just, uh, like I said, dude, a huge admirer, huge fan of your stuff. And uh, I'd like to do this again if you wanted to, because I think we could probably get real techie and geeky about it and not have to talk about antidepressants oh, so much. Yeah, no, that's cool, too. <laughs> and honestly, that's probably what most people want to hear. I know. You know what I was gonna say, and, yeah. and they're probably getting sucked into this podcast and realizing it's just a self-help mm-hmm. talk yeah. podcast. But uh, well, whatever, man. You made your movie the way you want. I make the podcast the way I want. Exactly, <laughs> it's gonna, dude. It's, That's it's on the stuff. path. It's going to connect me with the right people. It's, it's it what is. it's meant to be. It's what I'm passionate about. Yep. Um, and I did a three-part series already on how to be a contract climber. So go check that out. Right. <laughs> yeah, dude. No, that's great. And yeah, you seem to be consistently making stuff. And I think that's half the battle. Oh, it's yeah. Just being able to make stuff Grind and it. not be like me. And like every six months, I'll just come out with a video. Or I'll just come out with like four in a in a you know a week span. That's it's better just to be nice and consistent and constantly practicing and constantly yeah. making. So you're doing the right thing, Kurt. You're you're gonna build this thing up. Thanks, you're man. You're gonna be like Jacob Rogers. Yeah, guilty oh, of Teresa. Guilty of He like transcends 
the industry now. He's just like, he is Instagram. I remember when <laughs> and, he would uh, message me back on Instagram. Me too, man. I thought he wanted to be in this movie. He didn't get back to me. I was like, you've been uh, out of home in here, dude. He's like, I'm too busy crane removing that with dude, my old school oh my God, I, helmet. Well, it just fell out of my chair. Yeah, Good no, thing you had uh, that on. I, like it. I know, dude. I was safe. See, that's the thing. You could have hit the deck there. Could have hit the deck. <laughs> Thank God. If you're not watching, by the way, why is suspended from... Uh, it looks walking. like from his SRS system to a stripper pole, stripper pole. I got it. So, yeah, maybe you should go onto YouTube and check it out on the video. There he is. I'm sweaty now. That was like <laughs> that was actually difficult. Oh, yeah, dude, this okay, place well, we is could, awesome. We could talk about tech one time. That's cool. I I shy away from it sometimes because, uh, mm. and I probably shouldn't, but just because I'm not uh, I'm not fluent. I'm not fluent in the tech, or even just like young tree structure pruning i could Ooh. talk about forever yeah like okay let's talk about gilman i want to talk about gilman i want to apologize okay. to gilman i want to talk to him <laughs> on the phone and have him approve of my <laughs> oh he's cool with it he don't care i if remember he's... that day my boss came up he's like i talked to ed afterwards and he's like ah, it's just a rough he's he, he said he didn't fault me for it because it was a nerve-wracking situation i had like 30 people I was one year into the company, still learning all this stuff, and they set me up this tree, and I made a dumb mistake ah. right in front of Edward Gilman. I think about it every day, and I just cringe. Yeah, it happened for a reason. Yeah, but for I wonder great. if he thinks about that, if he even remembers that story. <laughs> he I, like, probably tells I, it at Christmas were, every day, every year. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> and, like, this is a redemption story. Like, I ended up being okay <laughs> and not a destroyer of worlds and trees. Dude, pruning talk would be sick though. I love pr mm. I love pruning and all that stuff. So, I'll yeah. bring pictures and videos and everything. We'll make Ooh. it multimedia because I work with these people at the park board too. Uh, Brian Voles, if you're watching, shout out to this guy. He and a handful of other people, Nick Grevy, like they're all really into this young tree structure pruning thing. Didn't make sense to me in the beginning because I was like, that's not putting on spikes and flying by a crane with a big chainsaw. They have really emphasized to me the importance of taking care of our children. That's mm -hmm. what young trees are. You know, the best time to plant a tree was yesterday. The second time is now or whatever. Yeah. There's a whole other side of this, what we do. And they remind me of that constantly, these people that I work with. So, um, yeah, like looking at the before and after pictures, this guy that I work with, Brian, every time it's like, you know, some crazy elm with five. And then he's got, got the reduction before and after. Yeah. Just a library full of these cool subordination wow. uh, pictures and videos and stuff. I've got time lapses of the whole process, and really, we don't talk about it enough. People are more about like, here's some span rigging and yeah, doing V cuts for crane rules. Like, there's there's a whole sect for that or whatever. But maybe some of us should cover reduction and stuff more often. Oh, for sure. Little I've got tons of tree health stuff on here. Perfect. Yeah. So th that's that's one of my passions too as i got to pull myself mm -hmm. away from some of this mental health stuff too because i don't want to scare away all my audience but um <laughs> yeah pruning man i love pruning okay so that'd be great we got to find a way i think i can screen share on here too so we'll do that okay. uh can you screen share on your side i wonder i wonder i don't know about your riverside fm thing but i know i can screen share through the software i use obs oh okay if well, you're gonna go through do youtube it. we could maybe do something like that figure it out I don't know. I like the way yours is set up, though. It's real simple, and I think I can share my screen if I go like this. Google Chrome would like to record this computer screen. Okay. 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 <laughs> oh, I'm not quitting. it. Nope. It wants me to quit and reopen. I'm not doing that. Nope. See? No. No. Nope. Well, okay. we can pre-plan for it next time, but then can you switch what? back and forth, I wonder, to your face and stuff? But Oh, look at that. Oh, dude. That's your screen. All right. So now let's go to Instagram. No. <laughs> <laughs> or my email or something. No. Yeah, so that's, that's great. you can share your screen. That's great. Perfect. Now we know what we're doing. Okay. All right. Well, let's, uh, yeah, let's plan that out. Okay, hey, buddy. We should... me, buddy. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, best of luck with uh, all the new connections you're going to make through this film. Yep. I know it's going to take you to the to the right place. To I the hope next so. Step. I hope the right the eyes step. find it, you know, because uh, I love to keep doing this, man. Just traveling, going to comps, meeting a bunch of tree nerds. For sure. The rest of the family. So for sure. Okay, buddy. I'm gonna hit stop record here and then uh don't exit yet. 
Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye.